Good evening. Um, thank you all for coming tonight. I quickly just want to provide you with a, um, an overview of what tonight's meeting will look like. Um, when the uh, board members come out, um, they will go through a few procedural items. Um, that will be followed by approximate, exactly 30 minutes of public comment. At the end of the meeting, which is usually around 11 tonight, um, there will be another opportunity for additional public comment. So if you do not get to speak during the first opportunity, we encourage you to stay. Uh, for public comment, the green cards that you all have been submitting um, will be agendized, will be organized by agenda item, excuse me. The board president will then rotate through the agenda items in order to hear from at least one person on each agenda item. The board president will also uh, call our students first and will prioritize the green cards that have been submitted, um, that were submitted by 715, so you still have a couple of minutes. Please note that if there are a lot of cards, not everyone who turned in a card will get to speak. Thank you. If your name is called, uh, you can cede your time to another speaker to do so. Um, thank you. Please stand up and state your name and indicate to whom you are ceding your time. When you cede your time, you give up your opportunity to speak on that topic and no one can later cede their time to you to speak on that same topic. We do not allow a speaker to combine speaking time for multiple people. The board president will determine whether to set tonight's speaking time at two or three minutes per speaker on an individual basis. Uh, he will also allow for extra time for those who need translation or have other speech needs. When you are speaking, please note that the light at the lectern um, right up there and right in front of the podium will turn yellow when there is one minute left. When your time has elapsed, the light at the lectern will turn red and you will hear beeping. If you are still speaking when your time is up, you are allowed to finish your sentence, but please do not try to speak beyond your time. We understand that there are really important issues that many people feel very passionate about, but in order to be fair to all, and so we can hear from as many speakers as possible, uh, the board president will ask you to stop once your time has elapsed. Uh, if you guys have any further questions, I'm happy to answer them on in, uh, individually. Thanks. And you're only going to put up with the maximum two meetings. So. Okay. That's doable. <laughs> Thank you. 
No, it would be like this. Because you'd be like, hello. It is?
watching your hobby and you're sitting in this comfy weird chair and you're going, I'm talking. Okay, guys, the microphone is All right, welcome everybody. We will get started in about 30 seconds.
All right. Good evening. I'll try that one more time to wake everybody up. Good evening. Good evening. All right. Welcome. Uh, welcome to the June 13th, 2018 meeting of the Berkeley School Board. If you want to follow along on our online agenda, you can do so on your phone or you can borrow a computer from Ms. Chides, who is right over there. I'd like to remind everyone that our board meetings are being broadcast live on YouTube and over the radio on channel 89.3 uh, FM, on TV and Comcast cable channel 33. This means that anything that is captured on video during this meeting, anything you say during public comment, will be archived online and uh, archived online forever. I will now call the open session of tonight's meeting to order, uh, 7.34. For the record, closed session began at 5.33. Ms. Chides, please share with the community members present our process for a translation of the meeting, and then please call the roll. Bienvenidos. Si hay alguien que desea dirigirse a la mesa directiva durante el periodo de comentario público, favor de hacérmelo saber, ya que le agregaremos más segundos a reloj durante sus comentarios. Gracias. Uh, Director Karen Hemphill. Present. Director Uma Nagaraja Swenson. Here. Director Bethany Slava Cutler. Present. Director Ty Alper. Present. Vice President Judy Appel. Here. Ms. Uh, President Josh Daniels. Here. All right, we will now approve the agenda. Are there any requested changes? Before we say anything, let me grab a, grab a pen. Okay, yes. any changes to the agenda, Madam Vice President? Yes, um, Director Hempel and I jointly wanted to pull um, items 12.4 and 12.5 okay. for discussion. For discussion. All right, so they'll go for discussion. discussion. We'll move them. Um, how about after item 17? Is that okay? Good. Yes. All right. I mean, the, most of the discussion is on 14.5, but they kind of go together. Okay. Any other changes? Hearing none. I have a yep. question about 12.13, but I think I'll keep it to my comments. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Director Nagarajan Swenson, would you like to move the agenda for your last board meeting? Yep. Motion. Motion with a yawn. <laughs> Is, is there a second? Second by Director Alper, without objection. The revised agenda, or the agenda as amended, is approved. All right. So now I will report out from our closed session. So item 3.1, collective bargaining, BCCE negotiations. We received an update. Uh, we discussed this item and gave direction. Item 3.2, collective bargaining with Local 21. We received an update. Item 3.3.1, uh, district negotiations with City of Berkeley regarding this facility. We discussed and gave direction. Item 3.4.1, superintendent uh, public employment we discussed. Uh, on the executive director for facilities, 3.4.2, we received an update and discussed. And item 3.5, superintendent evaluation, we discussed. Okay, uh, an overview of tonight's meeting is next. So um, this is one of the most important meetings of the year. Uh, we have two uh, items, one being the local control and accountability plan, the other being the LCAP that will be here for a public hearing. Um, so these two documents will be guiding what we do uh, for the next year and potentially the next two or three years. And so even though you may be here for other things, I would like to encourage you to stick around or if you need to leave, listen to the continuation of the meeting on the radio or on YouTube because this is really where we as a board and as a district make decisions that will be affecting students next year and into the future. So if you're able, understanding that you have work or school tomorrow, uh, to, to at least uh, stay tuned in. 
we would appreciate it. All right, before we get to public comment, we're going to do tonight's trivia question. And as Ms. Chaitas is walking over to set that up, just to give a little context, we do uh, trivia um, every board meeting. The trivia question is in the back of the room on hard copy. We also post it um, through this PowerPoint. And we try to shift gears a little bit towards an academic instructional question tonight. Um, if you can't stick around for when we read the answers at, or we ask for answers at 930, you can email us your answers at trivia at berkeley.net. Um, we do give first right to those who are here to answer the question, and if you get it right, you get BUSD swag. Um, if we don't get any right questions here or via email, we go to the Twitter sphere and see what, the, what they have to say. Okay. So the California State Standards, also known as the Common Core State Standards, are a set of shared goals and expectations for the knowledge and skills in English Language Arts, ELA, and math at each grade. So this is basically what we want our students to know in these two areas in each grade. So we have three questions related to these standards and their applications to our students. Next slide, please. Question number one, in what grade do Berkeley students not formally study the history of the United States? Second grade, fifth grade, eighth grade, or 11th grade. So one of these grades, and only one, we do not formally study the history of the US. Next question. With respect to reading informational texts, in which grade are Berkeley students expected to distinguish their own point of view from that of the author of a text? So that's an important distinction. It's an important sort of step in pedagogical learning. So at what grade are we expecting our students to know that distinction? Third question. So this is a little bit long, but I'm a math guy, so I apologize. Um, in what grades are students expected to be able to answer the following math problem? Okay. If the population of the U.S. is approximately 3 times 10 to the 8, and the population of the world is approximately 7 times 10 to the 9th, then approximately how much larger is the population of the world than the US? So what grade would we want a student of ours to be able to answer that question? And then the extra credit, because I could not resist, is what is the answer to that math problem? <laughs> 15 times larger, 20 times larger, or 25 times larger? And again, the actual questions are written down in the back of the room if you would like to review them. Um, and again, if you get the answer, you get some BSD schwack. Is this like, are you smart, that show, are you smarter than a fifth grader? Some greater, <laughs> some greater. All right, thank you. So uh, the next item on the agenda is 30 minutes of public comment. We'll do three minutes each. Uh, Ms. Chaitis has already explained the process for public comment. Um, to keep things moving, we ask that the speaker who is next in line come forward and wait near the lectern, basically against the wall near that picture over there. And I apologize in advance if I pronounce anyone's name incorrectly. Uh, please note that the board does not respond directly to comments or questions made during public comment. Board members, the superintendent staff, we do take notes during public comment and we may follow up with the speaker after the meeting. There is a period at the, at the end of the meeting, oh, sorry, there is a period later on in the agenda during which board members and the superintendent have a few minutes each to make, a, to make our own comments. Uh, this is a time in which board members can choose to respond to something said in public comment or make any other comments if you want to. We have found that this process keeps our meetings running smoothly, allows for a maximum amount of people to speak during the 30 minutes allotted for public comment, and it ensures compliance with the Brown Act, which does not allow the board to discuss items that are not placed on the meeting agenda. Lastly, I want to remind all speakers that there are children in the audience, they may be listening, watching at home, so please keep that in mind as you speak. If you have specific complaints by district employees, we encourage you to take advantage of our formal complaint procedure or process rather than using public comment for that purpose. And again, please remember that anything you say is being broadcast live and will be archived online forever. All right, so. First up will be Denise Daflon followed by Leslie Lippard.
Okay. Good evening, school board members and superintendent Evans. I'm Denise Daflon and a PSC rep for Sylvia Mendes this year. I am here to thank our PSC co-chair, Dominique Aspers and Maya Glenn, for stepping up to take the crucial road and certainly not easy. I'm also thankful to Dr. Sadler and her team for providing data and meeting minutes and for inviting other BUSD staff to present. I think that PSC has a lot of potential, while the main challenge for me was to understand what is part of the PSC tasks and what is not. I recognize the work that is done by BUSD staff and the school board to develop a vision for BUSD education and its LCAP plan. And as many, I still struggled when I see the achievement gap of targeted students. I am wondering if to make sufficient uh, impacts, BUSD might go beyond LC funding formula that counts students just as one, even if they have several um, challenges. Uh, so to go beyond that and at least shift some funding to bridge the gap forced, faced by students that belong to multiple targeted subgroups. I suggest that LCAP provide more direct support to struggling and achieving students that belongs to multiple targeted subgroups. I would like to share example of as far as the times, let me go, to illustrate why I suggest that. First, I feel like under, unduplicated students are, as a group, only seen as struggling students. When I think about the achievement gap, I see primarily missed opportunities. For instance, summer reading setbacks have really well been uh, documented and researched, and it does not affect students that meet, it does also affect students that meet standards. Yet, besides Bear summer school, nothing has been presented to PAC to replace ramp up and address the summer slide at elementary level. Second, I feel like reclassified fluent English proficient students are considered done with their English language, even so LCFF provides money for them for four years after reclassification. For instance, if a reclassified student is struggling in math, is it because of the subject or because of the language? If a reclassified student meets the standard in science, could he be above it and become confident in his potential if he was provided with specific language instruction? That is why I suggest that BUSD LCAP provides direct support to reclassified students that are also socioeconomically disadvantaged so they can reach their potential. Thank you and have a great summer. Thank you. Uh, Leslie Lippard, followed by Gaur Partap Singh. Can I go? Yes, please. Hello. Um, tonight, as the school year comes to a close, I am here to share with you some troubling data, to cite some statistics, and I'd also like to give you a gift. Um, as I'm sure you all know by now, my daughter, Stella, experienced harassment in her classroom at Cragmont School. I recently learned that 10 of the 45th grade girls at Cragmont School are leaving the district for private school. Data about average rates of exit is hard to come by, and you probably know more about that than I do. Um, but I understand, for example, at John Muir, there's one student, a boy, who's leaving. So that 10 people are leaving, and all of them are girls, seems quite outside the statistical norms. When I think about that, 25% of the girls who experience the Cragmont environment, they voted with their feet, and they're leaving. I think if that were any other demographic subgroup, the outcry for social justice would be deafening. In my mind, that's failure on an epic scale. People talk about racial inequality in education, and there's a term for this. It's called the pipeline to prison. I don't know if there's a term for what girls experience, where in elementary school they experience verbal harassment, and we say, the boys don't really understand what they're saying. They're too young. In middle school, girls experience comments about their bodies, bra straps are popped, there's other unwanted touching, and we say boys will be boys rather than calling it what it is, assault. In high school, harassment's a daily occurrence. 
Unwanted touching is unremarkable, and there's a few cases of rape. In college, we get Brock Turner, and eventually we get to the current state of our society where every day there's another Me Too revelation. We might call this the expressway to entitlement, the entitlement that men have to comment on, to touch, and to abuse female bodies. I don't know a single adult woman who's not been harassed, and every 98 seconds another woman is assaulted, according to Rain. I don't mean to suggest that all men are rapists or that even a lot of men harass, but one creep can create a lot of trauma. A few weeks back, I had an opportunity to meet with Superintendent Evans. We had a good conversation, and he expressed his commitment to do something about this. He articulated a compelling plan that included training and awareness and unconscious bias and behavioral norms in the classroom and classroom and yard management. And I wanted to encourage you all to give him your full support in this critically important issue. I would also suggest that BUSD begin to compile school-level data about the rates of harassment and assault in each school. This could easily be accomplished by leveraging the survey that's mandated by BSEP and implemented by the PTA. I believe that if what we learn will horrify us and create a call to action that we cannot ignore. Right? I'm out of time. I'd like to give you a gift. Uh, the gift is a book by an author named Roxanne Gay, who has written about her experience. Part of her life experience is that she experienced a gang rape by her classmates when she was 12 years old. My daughter is 11. Many people have said that our speaking about this Thank is you. inappropriately sexualizing the boys. And I would like to implore you to redouble your efforts to break up this tragic cycle and make it so that it has no place in our Berkeley schools. Thank you. Thank you. Um, all right, uh, uh, Guru Pratap uh, Singh, excuse, excuse me, sorry. Uh, Guru Pratap Singh followed by Olivia Spencer. Good evening. My name is Gurpreet Tap Singh, and I'm 80 years old and in third grade at Oxford Elementary School. I believe that the Berkeley Unified School District should have a sustainability plan. I know it is possible to be sustainable because we have been doing it for the last almost 180 days in my classroom. We have only filled this one quart jar of landfill waste in 180 days with 21 students and one teacher. Sustainability should be taught like reading and writing. Sustainability uses a lot of math. In my classroom, we write in our sustainability notebooks. We use a lot of math to calculate what we have kept out of the landfill. When we have multiplied it all out, we found we had kept 1,440 gallons of waste out of the landfill and not used 4,132 pieces of disposable plastic. Another reason we should have a sustainability plan is that the school district is wasting money buying plastic utensils in the first place and then wasting more than spending to put them in the landfill. If we have metal utensils, then the school district will not have to waste money to buy throw away utensils. Instead, we can reuse them so there will be less shopping and less dumping. A third reason then, is that with a sustainability plan, we can all be more zero waste. And this can help save the marine life in our oceans. Did you know that almost every species in, of animals in the ocean is endangered? Only the deep living species like the giant squid is not endangered. Did you know that there are only 10,000 to 25,000 blue whales left? And the main reason every ocean animal is endangered because of plastic. Some whales think that the cans and cups are big krill and they eat them and die. I hope I have persuaded you to support the sustainability plan for our Berkeley students. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Olivia Spencer, followed by Fiona Grothridi.
Good evening. My name is Olivia Zora Spencer. I am nine years old and also in the third grade at Oxford School. I think that we should support the new sustainability plan. I believe all students need to learn about the problem of plastic pollution. Much of the plastic we throw away ends up in the ocean. We would not be here right now on this. Um, we need to find a better solution because without the ocean, we would not be here now on this planet. As Sylvia Earle, one of the three people who has explored the Mariana Trench, the deepest part of the ocean floor, says, <clears throat> with every drop of water you drink, every breath you take, you're connected to the sea. School is educating us and preparing us for life. But what about how we live on the earth and how we go about making all this trash? I know that it is possible for us to make changes to help the earth, the oceans, and the animals. I know this because I have been in a zero waste class this school year. Um, if my class can do it, all the classes in Berkeley can. All we need to do is to use and remember. In my classroom, it is a job to take care of the metal, cutlery, and cups. We do this every day at breakfast and lunch. Plastic pollution is a really big problem. If we work together with all the schools in Berkeley, I think we can change this problem. Now I ask you once again, please support the new sustainability plan for the future and the health of all children just like me. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Uh, Fiona groth Reedy, followed by Allison Appen, or Apen. Hello, my name is Fiona groth Reedy. I'm nine years old and in the third grade at Oxford Elementary School. I believe we should have a sustainability plan for all Berkeley schools and children. I believe this because all children should be educated about pollution and global warming, or else they'll just keep polluting. Our, generations, our generation of kids are the ones who have to help. If they don't, the oceans will become even warmer than they are now. They don't know, if they don't know about the problems, they won't be able to help. We are the ones creating the problems, like plastic pollution that is making sea animals sick. So we need to begin to fix them. We need a sustainability plan to help young people understand what we are doing and what we need to do. We need to work and learn as a team. My class has been zero waste all class year. If a class of nine-year-olds can do this, then every class in Berkeley can too. For me, it has been interesting to see how little trash we have made. As you can see here in this jar, we have only made one quart of waste the whole 180 days of this school year. I thought it would be easy, but it's a bit complicated. You can't use mechanical pencils or yellow painted pencils. You need to use unpainted pencils because those are compostable. This experience has changed my mind, and it can change everyone's mind. But it only works if we learn. Learn about what we need to stop. I believe that with a sustainability plan, we can learn faster and find solutions faster. If you skip one straw or pick up one plastic bag, it still makes an impact on the earth. If we had a sustainability pl plan, more students would do this and they would help more. Even acts like carpooling to school would help. A sustainability plan can help this. If you support a sustain this sustainability plan, it can be the big effort that helps save our planet. With more people working together, things can happen faster. Every person who helps will affect at least one other person, and so the idea will grow and spread. Let's start in our school and save the pl this planet. Thank you for listening to my opinion. If you could support the sustainability plan, we children would really appreciate it. Thank you. Allison Apin, followed by Elisa Ballard. Just wanted to thank the board for your service. Yeah, that was the one thing that I didn't get to say earlier as my time ran out, was that we very much appreciate the service of this board and uh, wanted to say thank you. Thank you. Elisa uh, Ballard, followed by Margot Hicks.
Hello, my name is Eliza Ballard. I am nine years old and in the third grade at Oxford Elementary School. I believe that the Berkeley Unified School District should support the new sustainability plan. I have three reasons. One reason is that our oceans are in danger. Did you know that on June 1st, a pilot whale died in Thailand because they ate over 80 plastic bags and they clogged its digestive system? I think we can all agree that it's horrible. It is important to keep our oceans clean to protect sea life. We did our part in class by reducing our waste to this one court job. This is all the trash we created from our whole school year. The second reason is that we can learn something new every day. Just this year, I learned that paint isn't compostable and how dangerous straws are for sea life. We visited the transfer station and learned that a lot of really hard plastics can't be recycled. And we learned to teach all parents to bring their own cups when they go get their coffee. If all the kids in Berkeley learned these types of things, they would grow up understanding how important it is to limit your waste. A third reason is knowing about sustainability will make all children more healthy. In my class's sustainability class, we learned that most gum is made of plastic, so now kids will eat less gum. Most chips, like Dorito chips, are wrapped in plastic, so now kids will eat less chips. Did you know that the chemicals from pla plastic actually go into your body? Children should know how plastic affects their health so they can be more prepared to lead healthy lives. In school, it is important to learn math and writing and history. But people should know that the earth is in danger, and that's why ki other kids in Berkeley should have a chance to learn what we learned this year about sustainability. Thank you for listening, and please support the sustainability plan for all Berkeley school children. Thank you, Margot Hicks, followed by Molly Hicks. Hello, my name is Margot Hicks, and I'm in third grade at Silvia Mendes Elementary. At Silvia Mendes, we care about the earth. Our green team and teachers teach us about the four R's, reduce, reuse, and recycle, and rock. We also learned about another R, refuse, like refusing plastic bags or straws at restaurants and stores. The most important R is probably reduce. If we reduce the amount of waste, we have less to sort and recycle. I also learned that lots of plastic is filling up the ocean, killing the animals that live there. We must do something quickly. At my house, we do everything we can to buy things in glass and metal, which are better for the earth. In school, we talk about reducing plastic, but then, at all, but then at school breakfast, we are surrounded by plastic. Look at this bag. This is from one day at Silvia Mendes. Can you believe it? We are sent cereal in these bowls twice a week. Now just imagine 75 of these at, at one school alone. That's 25,000 bowls and spoons. If if you add up all the cereal bowls at the 11 elementary schools so that it makes 275,000 a year, there is also just as many plastic cream cheese containers, plastic wrappers, and at lunch, they make us use plastic cups for water and, and also plastic forks. That is, the way, that is way too many plastic objects going into the landfill. We need your help to make a change. I hope you can help make the change. Good night and thank you for listening. Thank you. Molly Hicks, followed by Jessica Loper. I'm going to go with Loper. Um, I have this little guy with me, so we'll see how long I can speak. I don't really have anything super prepared because I was hoping to pass my time to Margo, no. but she did an awesome job. My name is Molly. Um, I have two kids at Sylvia Mendes, one in third grade and one in fourth grade. And I've been doing a lot of work with the sustainability plan as well as on the green team at our school. We feel like there could be a lot more that the school district could be doing. It's really difficult to make any changes, even simple things like let's compost the paper towels took years to accomplish. Um, which we did and we're very happy about. 
Um, but many of the things that I've done have been with waste reduction, and there's so many resources out there. Susan's sustainability plan, I really hope that you will adopt because there's, she's done thorough research and really, really wonderful uh, resources that we have in the Bay Area to work with, like Stop Waste, who works with schools. Uh, we're kind of underutilizing them. Um, so I encourage you to think about, I mean, everybody is, is thinking about the environment these days, but I feel like in, it's kind of in name alone in, in Berkeley. I mean, when you look at this, this is a lot of trash just in one day. And that's just, that doesn't even consider all of the trash that we use. And I, even myself, were using plastic cups for the kids, which are totally unhealthy at lunch. Um, so I convinced the PTA to just fund paper cups at our school. So I feel like this is Berkeley. We could be doing this so much better. It, it shouldn't be so much work to try to just switch to paper cups, you know, that are compostable and healthier for the kids to use. Um, so her plan is not just about waste, but also about reducing just our footprint generally. And I know that you guys have really, re everybody cares about the earth, and we re and those kids especially, you guys have done a great job pointing out all, what it's doing to the oceans, all the plastic. And this problem that we have here, I just wanted to point out, five years ago when my son started, this, we were kind of like, wow, this is a lot of trash that we're using. When I contacted Nutrition Services, they said, well, it's a cost issue. Now we have this twice a week. And I, I feel like we're just really going backwards. So uh, hopefully you can adopt the plan and make things a little easier with the people who need to make the changes in their departments. And again, I also want to say thank you very much for all of your work that you've done. I've been here a couple times this school year. So thank you very much. Thank you. Jessica Loper, followed by Charlene Woodcock. Hi, I'm Jessica Loper. I am a parent of a second grader at Jefferson Elementary School. And um, I support the sustainability plan. You can see a theme. Uh, I feel like I should have um, a sign too, so yay. <laughs> uh, I guess I'll start by just explaining how I look at um, where other places are doing a good job. And so uh, if you think of the Japanese culture and how they teach their children at a very young age how to respect the community they live in, uh, the children prepare their own food uh, for their fellow classmates. They're taught uh, that the fisherman uh, works hard to catch the fish um, so that way they have food in their tummies um, and to only take the amount of food that they need to limit the waste. And at the end of the school day, the children are using, uh, they have specific roles. So they have a job, a purpose, and they feel good about that. Um, and they are actually cleaning up the, their school and they have, um, respect and care for their school. And so the concept of having um, a sustainability plan that will be available for the children to use and, and encourage them to be in charge of as well, it just sounds lovely. Uh, and so I'm really enthusiastic about the sustainability plan and how to teach those children the healthy eating habits now uh, and along with those breakfasts and snacks that they receive on site, so like what the kids have explained and the four R's and especially since I'm sure everyone knows that um, since January 1st of this year, China has is no longer accepting our plastics. So we have to figure out something to do with it. So at this point, and even in Oregon, they were taking it and now they're not. So now it just goes to the landfill. So it's not actually like we're recycling anymore with those particular ones. So um, we want our district to be a model to others uh, this is our opportunity, and uh, there's a lot of parents and teachers and kids and staff that you can see that are all really enthusiastic about it. Uh, and so we hope you are too. Thanks. Thank you, Charlene Woodcock, followed by Susan Silber. Hi, I'm following up on a letter I emailed today, which you may not have seen yet, but it kind of follows. An couple of other letters I've written over the last two years, um, it, especially because at the federal level, 
there is such gross irresponsibility with regard to climate change, it becomes all the more important for cities and states to really move out. <laughs> it's too late to move out in front of this problem, but to, to start making dramatic changes. And uh, it sometimes now seems like it's the children who are going to force this issue because they're beginning to realize that it's their lives that we are trashing. So um, what I've written about you to you before and want to mention again is the dramatic change that could come if we get rid of our gas oil burning school buses and replace them with electric buses and put more solar cells. I know several schools have solar arrays, but there are others that have good space for us to put cells up so that we're covering the, um, the fuel needs of electric buses. And there is right now, I found out about in a couple weeks ago, a f uh, state uh, fund of, I think, 73, 76 million dollars um, to help school districts in California make this conversion. Uh, and I took a look at the application today. It looks pretty straightforward. And um, I would certainly hope that somebody on staff can fill out that application. It's due at the end of the summer. So if somebody could get going on it now, I don't think it's going to take a lot of time. Uh, I put the link in the email I sent you today. And in addition, the school districts that uh, receive funding for a bus or several buses will also get uh, $60,000 each to cover the cost of um, charging stations. So uh, we should not let this opportunity go by. And I'm sure there are others, too. Uh, I haven't taken the time yet to l look into it, but um, I would just like Berkeley to galvanize and do something that is. And if we get the existing uh, solar arrays on a single um, continuum so that the savings can be assessed, it becomes much easier to convey to parents that we're saving money as well as cleaning up the air for our children uh, if we can make this conversion. So, thank you. Susan Silber, the last speaker of the night then will be um, El Shia Vasquez. They all, okay, I'm, I'm not gonna be too long because I already spoke and I think that all of these amazing kids and parents also spoke in behalf of the sustainability plan that I've been working on. And I just wanna just ask you, I, I know that you're gonna be speaking about local control. I know you're gonna speak, be speaking about the budget tonight, so how much language is there in around sustainability around climate sustainability solutions how much of the budget is devoted to teaching our children about these really important topics and we know when we teach and we know when we address um, facilities like um, put in solar for example or energy conservation we can save a lot of money so I just want to ask you that. How much of this current budget, how much of this uh, uh, local control is addressing this topic of sustainability? So again, I look forward, Dr. Edison, to speaking with you next week during our meeting. And I've met with most of you school board members. And um, I'd love to meet with you, uh, Ms. Hempel. That would be really great. I'd love to, um, we could meet during the summertime. This is a really, um, important topic, I feel, that um, a lot of people have a lot of s support for and could do the, really um, transform the district in a very positive way. And thank you again, students, for taking the time. And Ms. Oman, you've done an amazing job with your zero waste classroom, so thank you. The last speaker, Elsha. Elsha. Elsha.
Elsha, yes. My apologies, Ms. Vasquez, That's go ahead. Fine. Thank you. Um, yeah, I don't have much else to add other than the impact of the sustainability plan, um, what it's had on our family, and by educating my daughter in her classroom, it's really helped hold me accountable and make me more conscious, and so it really has the potential to create a ripple effect, as well as um, a personal experience. When I was younger, my family, um, my father, grew up in a low-income community of color, Mexican and, and uh, white, like pretty poor, and there was a toxic waste dump. So a lot of this waste, as was mentioned earlier, is getting pushed onto communities that don't really have access to this education or much of a voice. Um, so I'm really grateful that it's kind of circling back to my daughter being educated in this way. Um, anyway, it, it, in that community, a lot of people were um, uh, getting cancer and really sick, and they were eventually able to sue the city, and uh, things changed, um, and that was many years ago. But we're still obviously um, dealing with this issue, and I'm just um, really grateful for the classroom that Miss Amania and the community that Miss Amania has created around this issue, and I think it's definitely a model example that um, every classroom in Berkeley can follow. I was a former teacher as well for many years, and didn't really do much in my own classroom aside from having those bins, but really wasn't like taking the time to understand where that waste was going and whether or not it was really um, helping or hurting the environment. So it has a lot of potential to um, impact um, the larger community besides just the students in the classroom. Thank you. All right, thank you. That now concludes this public comment period. Um, um, Daniels, yep. may I just say one thing? Yep. I just wanted to tell the students from um, Oxford and Sylvia Mendez that you taught us all a lot and that you it was just really great to hear from you. So I want to just tell you what an excellent job you did. And I learned a lot, and I bet the rest of us learned a lot. So thanks for coming and talking to us. And Ms. Amania, too, who I know has been around forever. And here you are with this innovative, great thing you're doing. So thanks. Okay. Um, if you still want to. Uh, if you do not get a chance to speak or it's not getting to speak enough, there is an additional public comment period at the end of the board meeting. You can always email us directly at boardofed at berkeley.net or contact us individually. Our information is posted online at berkeley.net slash board uh, slash school dash board. Now we have an opportunity to hear from our unions. Each union has five minutes to address the board on issues of its choosing. I see Ms. Campbell here from BFT. Any other unions? All right, Ms. Campbell, you are up. Good evening, board members. Um, can we just give it up one more time for our students? They're so amazing. Yeah. It's truly inspiring, right? It makes you realize what we're doing and why we're doing it. And um, the impact that schools can make on our future. So really enjoyed that. Um, I want to speak very briefly tonight. I know you have a very full agenda. I'm Kathy Campbell. I'm the president of the Berkeley Federation of Teachers. I wanted to speak tonight um, on the LCAP plan. I wanted to um, just summarize some of BFT's thoughts. So um, for the last maybe now five years, BFT has emphasized four key items in our LCAP. Those four key items are support for mental health and behavioral health, uh, RTI, support for RTI, uh, support to increase the diversity of our teaching staff, and um, support for restorative practices. And I want to say that all of these are reflected in the proposals that you're getting. And we want to really thank the board for your continued support in these four areas. Um, I think that we can see that we're making a difference with regards to our teachers of color and the diversity of our staff. And we have seen some progress this year. I know you're going to get a report in a couple of weeks. We have seen some progress with regards to our hiring timeline. We're very excited about the classified uh, grant that we got, which BFT really pushed for and tried to motivate and helped to write the second 
time around. Um, and we're so excited that we got that. I was with Dr. Evans last week at the reception for the grant fellows, and um, that was just a thrill. Um, and I think there's huge potential there um, in this area. So we really appreciate all the effort that went into that. Um, I want to speak for a minute about um, the three other items. So with regards to mental health and behavioral health, it's our understanding that there's some uh, new money for next year, and we want to really urge the board to consider increasing the investment in this area. Um, it can sound like a lot, $20,000 per school, but really when you look at our need, and I think you've been learning about this, and many of you study this professionally, you've heard from the students with the MEET program, you've decided to invest in that. The needs are great across our district, including K-8, and we encourage you to think about that as a place for some of these new funds. Um, with regards to RTI, I want to say that I see a significant difference these last two years. And what I attest that to is the presence of very skilled district coordinators. They're teachers on special assignment. They're not administrators. But district uh, visionaries with regards to our IT, RTI systems have made an incredible difference, in my opinion. They're bringing us closer to best practices and standards of practice across our schools. I think we need to do more at our middle schools. The focus has been on K-5. But that position, which I don't think, I'm not sure if it's funded in the LCAP or Common Core, or I can't always tell you that right off the top of my head, but that district position um, in which we have right now uh, two very skilled people, Kirsten Snyder and Simone Miller, is what's made the difference in my opinion. And I'm glad that that position will be continuing next year. Um, lastly, I want to talk about restorative practices. I want to really urge the board to encourage staff to finish our roadmap. Because right now it's, it's somewhat anecdotal and somewhat um, unclear where we decide to invest money and, and what money we really need and, and what our overall plan is. So it's sort of like this is working. We'll, you know, it, we, I just think we need a more intentional plan and we need a five-year plan that we can then try to fund. Um, and I, I really hope the board will work on that uh, in the fall. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Any other district committees? Sorry, any other unions? Now there's an opportunity to hear from district committees. Each committee has five minutes. Parent advisory committee. Any other district committees who are here, just so I know? Okay. Hi, so I'm here for PAC. Um, so dear BUSD Board of Directors, my name is Dominica Spears, the co-chair of the PAC. Uh, we submitted PAC comments to the superintendent of schools. We have also emailed a copy directly to you today. Um, this evening, I would like to highlight for you some of the major concerns that arose repeatedly during our PAC meetings. Number one, we need to focus more on math. We have seen some gains in ELA due to our current district-wide spending efforts in reading. We believe the district should offer comparable spending in math, which includes direct services to students. As it may be impractical for the math, math coach to work directly with students, one of our comments include that the math coach work with classified support staff, who then would work with our students in the extended day learning programs. In addition, we support a district-wide pre and post screening tool, which will provide concrete data as it relates to the effectiveness of our intervention systems. Number two, we strongly support funds allocated for the extended day learning programs. However, it was apparent that many schools were not utilizing these funds. We would like a process established so that the schools commit to using these funds, and if not, other schools are notified and, can be and those funds can be used accordingly. Number three, we need to consider the overall funds that each school budget has available to them to support all students. For example, if one school is highly concentrated with low-income students, the district should ensure that there are more funding sources to allocate to support those schools and properly meet the needs of those students and families. Number four, school climate. 
The PAC is concerned we are still not holding schools accountable for the blatant implicit biases which impact many of our unduplicated students. If BUSD continues to fund programs but does not address the culture and the climate of the school, for example, negative teacher-student relations, peer relations based on stereotypes, our efforts will not be effective. We have to get to the root of the problem and address racism head on. The PAC strongly supports hiring African-American teachers and creating welcoming school environments for all, which includes teachers of color. Schools need to be held accountable for creating welcoming spaces for all. And if not, again, our work goes in vain. Number five, we also reviewed data which showed rates of ELL achievement at each school and the method used, either designated ELL ELD support, for example, pull out, or an integrated ELD support model. We would like to ensure that BUSD implements the best practices for all for, for ELL achievement. Um, the California dashboard shows data, shows ach achievement gap data for reclassified fluent English proficient students. English language supports, not only ELA, are needed in both math and science. It's critical for these students to access the material and in the long run support their college and career paths. LCFF allocates money to reclassified students for four years after reclassification. We would like to see those resources and programs to address the needs of reclassified students. Um, number seven, the restorative justice program. We would like to see facilitators trained effectively to be able to work with the school population that they're serving. If they're not able to adequately facilitate a restorative justice circle, that does not work. In conclusion, it is painful to see the achievement gap at BUSD for all of our unduplicated students. We want to make sure unduplicated students are receiving proper supports. We do have many programs available, but as a district, we are not making sure that we're implementing them with fidelity. We are tired of the excuses of why initiatives didn't work. We want solutions to address any past excuses offered. For example, we can't find the teachers or the students to engage or come regularly. So please review the timing of when and how you target both groups. The efforts on when and how people are reached matter. Another example would be recruiting retired or substitute teachers who are willing to work extended day programs to support our students. The answer cannot be cut. It has to be improved. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, now there's time for board members and the superintendent to make comments. Looking down, you get to go last. Anybody? Anybody? Bueller? Okay, Vice President Appel. <clears throat> okay. Oops. Good evening, everyone. Um, so I have. Uh, I wanted to fill you in on. Um, this is Natalie. I want to have Natalie's attention. <laughs> I wanted to fill you in on um, some conversations that we've been having with the city of Berkeley. Um, I know there have been some discussions about their use of our boardroom, and I wanted to let the public know that this board has been working with the city council, um, and we are moving closer to reaching an agreement regarding the city's use of this boardroom facility for their public meetings. Um, so it's been a, a, a good process, and I think that we're far enough along in our discussions that you can anticipate a joint announcement between the city and BUSD soon. Um, I also wanted to make one more plug, um, something I've been thinking a lot about, and that is that we um, here at BUSD, we have incredible high quality early childhood education centers, um, preschools. Our staff are really well trained. Um, they're fun, they're engaging, they prepare our students, and we all know that uh, quality early childhood education is critical for kids um, being able to succeed K through 12. Um, we have both half day and full day programs, and the reason I'm bringing this up is because this is actually a, um, one of our best kept secrets, and I don't know that people necessarily know parents of preschool age students or parents of um, 
uh, approaching pre preschool aged uh, parents, n kids know that we have the, these programs and this they um, have a sliding scale, and the um, and so they're worth checking out. So if you haven't yet had a chance to check out our early childhood education programs and you're watching this, um, I just would really encourage you because they're kind of the best deal in town. And um, uh, you know, and it, it's it's just baffling to me that in an environment where there's a a shortage of early childhood education slots that um, you know that our preschools aren't full. So definitely check them out. It could be it could be a great future for your kid. That's it. Right, thank you, Director Alper. I just want to thank. Um, are we allowed to talk about Director? You're allowed. I get to say the most, but go ahead. <laughs> Let me try to think of exactly what Josh was going to say. <laughs> say exactly. Yeah. Just, you'll say it better no matter what. It's okay. I, get a chance I didn't realize it was her last meeting. So, uh, but having now realized that, I want to thank you for your service to the district, to the students, your. Um, collegiality on this board. It's been a real asset to, to our team, um, and we look forward to following your educational career, your professional career, whatever it is, um, and uh, I just wanted to thank you and congratulate you on graduation. And we will see you on Friday. I didn't realize we weren't going to have a chance to do this later, so I also have to add, I had still a minute and a half left. So I just want to say, Uma, that you are an amazing person to work with, an amazing colleague. You're just brilliant. You're really just, I mean, not only did you, were you did you do an excellent job at presiding over our meetings, um, but you also just are, you're just really insightful and I've learned a lot from you. So I'm sorry I won't get a chance to work with you this summer, as I'd hoped, but um, please know that myself and I think all the board are here for any support we can provide you as you're moving along in your career. And you have a really awesome family. <laughs> Thank you. Um, ditto to that in terms of the leadership. I think your, your points were always on your questions and your uh, uh, to to the board and to our staff are all very well taken and we all learned a lot. So I'm going back to the items on the consent calendar and seeing um, the approval of the school safety plans and seeing the um, items under the safety plan that which is very encompassing and I'm glad to see um, a plan that has very much uh, uniformity throughout the school districts. But there's a couple of things that I didn't see there that I have a question about that I know it has come to me also as a question. First, I know we have a plan for the Columbine locks. I think it's in our schools. I think the plan for our installation should be part of this so that parents, because this is annually updated, should be part of this. Um, the training for parents and staff on our plan. What is that plan that we have for that? for, um, and, and in particular to the re reunification of our families should an incident happen. As you've seen on many, unfortunately many times on television, we see the parents are outside, what is the plan that we have? I think that's a critical piece that a lot of parents and our staff need to know how we um, respond and what, and actually also practice with our families um, such a thing because it could be very traumatic, troubling, concerning, uh, and so many things could go wrong. And so it's important, I think, to have that. And it's, it's also been brought to my attention by some family members and community members. So just wanted to point that out. I don't know if it's something that we can later on pull out as an addendum or add to it, but I certainly think it's a, an important pro process to the safety plan. Um, real quick, um, my next uh, office hours will be in August, August 20th, and so in between, uh, you can always email me and I will respond and we can set up a time. Thank you. Uh, so a few things. First of all, I want to thank you, Uma, for your service this year. It's been a pleasure working with you, and I appreciate the fact that not only did you bring your own individual insight that was always on point, but you truly represented our diverse student body in making sure that you uh, checked in with them and, and brought 
the variety of, of opinions and, and, and concerns to us as the Berkeley High rep. So thank you very much for that. It was a really pleasure. And I have no doubt of uh, you're going to really enjoy college. So good for you. Um, I want to then also um, say congratulations to all of our Berkeley High and BTA graduates. Um, as you all know, Friday is graduation. Uh, it will probably be my last Berkeley High graduation, and I am really looking forward to not it being my last, but there is something about a Berkeley High graduation that um, is an experience that I know that I'm going to miss when I leave the board. Um, I also wanted to, um, two other things really quickly, is one, I also wanted to um, say to the community that came out um, around sustainability that I look forward to meeting with you. Um, I have some uh, unique, pers uh, I think, perspectives in sustainability and that in 1989, as a city employee, I worked with the district to put together the first recycling program. And uh, it was a paper base because at the time that was all that was being recycled in Berkeley was was pretty much paper and in in glass and tin, um, and a lot of what failed in terms of trying to make that really embedded in the district is what I see the differences today, and that is uh, a commitment meant by the school community as a whole around sustainability. Because if you don't have your local school site champions, if you don't have teachers who are working with students to understand the importance of changing behavior, then it does not work coming from above, so to speak. It really needs those individual championships. So I, I appreciate the fact that you've come uh, and, and, and want to extend what we are doing. Lastly, I just want to call attention to uh, on the consent calendar 1217 and 1218. Uh, 12, uh, they both have to do with new career technical education uh, courses that the, the board is being asked to approve. One is a curriculum on the fundamentals of carpentry, um, and the other one is on public and community health. And recently, we've been hearing um, from our career technical education staff that now uh, one out of every three Berkeley High student is now enrolled in at least one career technical education class. It might be through the biotech program. It might be, you know, in quite a few ones, it might be in fire science. It might be some, uh, you know, we are now starting a robotics program. And I, and of course, we are breaking ground on our new $5 million makerspace at uh, Berkeley High, as well as a mini makerspace at Longfellow. And I personally think it's one of the most exciting things that we are doing now as a district. I think it truly is becoming um, 21st century education is to understand that education is multifaceted and there is a lot of value in introducing students to the many varieties of what career and work can be. And uh, it's not an either or of tech versus college, but it's an and. So uh, I really want to thank that staff, and uh, this is just more proof of the good work that we are doing in expanding our opportunities for our students. So good evening. Um, this is our last week of school, and we have quite a few end of the year activities, events, promotions at our elementary schools and as well as our middle schools. I do want to congratulate all of our seniors. Uh, they will be graduating on Friday. And I particularly want to send a shout out to Uma. I am so proud of you. You've done an amazing job as a board member. Not only did you represent the board very well, but you represented your students in a way that I have not seen before. And, and all of our board members were great. Student board members were great. Um, but like I said, you have done an amazing job. Your advocacy um, for the students uh, meant a lot, not only to them, but to us as well. And so I'm looking forward to your success and you coming back and sharing that with us. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much. You missed so much, Mom. You'll have to watch yeah, it. <laughs> She actually came to hear me speak, so, <laughs> yeah, um, she missed what Ty had to say. Um, so, uh, Director Nagarajan Um I have the pleasure of now seeing seven 
different student, six, one served for two years, uh, board reps, including my own cousin, um, who was here. A, a, so many relatives of Berkeley. So many relatives of Berkeley, I do. Um, and you know, each, each student rep <clears throat> brought their own unique approach and style. Um, and, and yours uh, was one of sort of, sort of quiet power. Um, that you weren't necessarily the most talkative of all the student board reps, um, but when you did speak, I think you could tell, and certainly everyone watching could tell, that the board members listened to what you had to say. And that will take you incredibly far, and I hope that when you become famous, you remember us, <laughs> and remember it the... Money. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I, I mean, and I know we joke about, about how amazing a board president you were, um, but, but all joking aside, um, and board members can attest to this, it is not easy to run a meeting with focus and efficiency <coughs> um, in, in, the, in public. You know, there's not a clear script. There's not a, you know, exactly, you have to just do it by feel. And your ability to run an entire board meeting and then other important board items in a way that frankly none of us on this board have done. And this is not an exaggeration. It, it, it was a unique skill that I hope you are proud of. I hope you can recognize it and I hope it, you allow it to um, you know, lead you into some really amazing places. So with that, um, we have a, a little a plaque we'd like to give you and I'll just read it out. Um, this is from the Berkeley Unified School District Board of Education to Uma Nagarajan Swenson. In recognition of your outstanding leadership and commitment while serving as student director on the Board of Education during the 2017-2018 school year. So on behalf of all of us, thank you very much. You have, you are not time limited, so you can okay. speak for as long as you'd like. Okay, well, <laughs> rest of the meeting. Um, just quickly, I remember being really embarrassed. Sorry, I'm going to expose you, Mom. But my mom said that at the first meeting, after I was sworn in, she like went into the car and cried for a while. So I can only imagine what she's going to do after this one. <laughs> it's out of love. Um, but yeah, this is my last meeting, and my last day of school is tomorrow, and graduation is Friday, which is like... Crazy. Um, I'm really, really going to miss these. One oh my God, I'm getting emotional. Um, I'm really going to miss these Wednesday night meetings, all the really wonderful people associated with them, all the school board members, obviously, but also just everyone who's come and spoken at these meetings, all the really committed parents and staff members and certified and classified staff, and really just everyone who has been here has made such a big impact on the experience I've had and now the future that I want to have. Um, I really learned a lot about our district and I was able to, to begin to see it from a wider perspective that I never really expected to recognize. Um, I started staring at problems within the whole district and sort of within America and like the education system as a whole, not just limited to the scope of Berkeley High, um, which I think was a really powerful lesson to me to, for me to learn. And I mean, it's definitely like been difficult at parts, especially having to like go to Berkeley High the day after we make a tough decision and like <laughs> see the backlash and like have teachers comment about like how, whatever, um, <laughs> um, from decisions we've had to make. But I think that that's a really big reason of why I did it is because I like really wanted to like be in that position and be able to sort of see the change being made. And I don't think that I would be who I am today at this moment I'm about to graduate from high school without being um, on this board for the last nine months. Um, you all and this experience really helped me find my voice, even though a lot of what we talked about just went straight over my head. <laughs> um, and it also really helped me recognize my values and what I find important. Um, also, I just wanted to say the fact that so many third graders came to this meeting and talked and the fact that so many little kids have come and middle schoolers and elementary schoolers and even one time we had like a five-year-old or something, um, really shows me that the future of this seat is in good hands, so I'm sure that you'll have someone much better and more qualified than me in the future. 
but thank you all for making me feel really, really welcome here and being models for who I want to be in the future. Um, I think this has really inspired me to pursue politics or policy or something. Um, and I mean, endings and transitions are always hard, as you can see by me being a wreck right now. Um, but I know that this will help me from everything I do, and I'm really ready to go out into the world. Thank you, guys. <clears throat> All right. Okay, so now we get to move on to our agenda. Our agenda. Um, you still have to vote. Director Geiser from Center, we're not done yet. So, a uh, consent calendar as amended. Is there a motion? I'll move. Or unless Director Nagarajan. Oh, I'll move. Motion by Director Nagarajan Swenson. Is there a second? A second. Second by Director Alper. Without objection, it is approved 6 0. Moving on to, hold on, where's my agenda? Somewhere. Sorry. Thank you. Item number 13, discussion of local control and accountability plan. So this item is a discussion and a public hearing. We're gonna hear the presentation from staff. We will then open the public hearing for comments. We will then close the public hearing and then we will have our board discussion. So before I turn it over to Dr. Sadler to uh, introduce us, I'll just say a couple of words. Um, this is the fifth public hearing of our LCAP, uh, fifth year we're doing it. This is, uh, they've made some changes over the years, but we have a three-year static LCAP, 17, 18, 18, 19, and 19, 20. And so we are making an adjustment to our LCAP based on what we've learned from this past year, what our goals are different for, for the future, um, but the uh, unlike our budget, which sort of rolls, uh, our, our three years are fixed for this term. So we're just now looking at 1819 and, and 1920. And we've had a number of uh, board presentations in accordance with a policy. The Parents Advisory Committee, the Educators Advisory Committee has, has weighed in. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it has been a, a, a quite in-depth and thorough process. Um, and the, the last thing I will note is just um, to thank the members of the PAC, the chairs of the PAC for coming tonight, for your statement, for bringing your lovely child to, to witness democracy in action, um, and for the work that, that our parents and educators do to help make this plan as robust as it is. So given time constraints, I won't go on and on. Um, but for all the prep work that has gone into this to br bring us here, thank you to everyone. Dr. Sadler. All right. Thank you for such a nice introduction and good evening board members and Superintendent Evans. Um, we're here this evening to present um, the LCAP plan for 1819 and 1920. And uh, we have some questions for you. We need some input before we prepare the final plan that we will bring back to you at the last board meeting in June. So this evening, um, as I said, we have questions for the board. Um, we're gonna share with you again the new actions and services that are being recommended. Um, I wanna also make sure that we have a brief conversation about the needs of our McKinney-Vento students. As you know, we're a district that's under technical assistance, and so there are some recommendations from Ace Alameda County Office of Education regarding uh, ways that we could better support those students. Um, we um, have had a request for additional support for Longfellow, and so we will share that with you this evening. Um, I have a few key points, I believe four or five, um, from our input meetings with our stakeholders. Um, there was a request at the last um, LCAP presentation early in May for data on our AVID and Bridge students. There was a request for additional information on our African American Success Program. Uh, there were questions about the U9 math teacher support. And then finally, um, when the May revise happened, we received additional funding for LCAP for this current school year, as well as for the two subsequent years. So we will ask you for leadership and guidance on a process for um, allocating those funds. 
Just a reminder, um, when we passed this Proposition 30, the voters of California, there were a few key items, um, and I just think it's really important that we always revisit them, that um, this is part of a bigger uh, funding stream that um, was proposed to the taxpayers by Governor Brown. Um, the LCFF, Local Control Funding Formula, and this LCAP plan is specifically around the additional funding that is a percentage that is supposed to be explicitly or principally directed at our unduplicated students. Those students are our English learners, our foster youth, and our students um, eligible for free or reduced meals. And in Berkeley, we added three additional subgroups, our African-American students, our Latino students, and our students with disabilities. When we look at the data um, on our student demographics, about 35% of our students fall into the unduplicated uh, percentage. Um, each school, District is required by this proposition to engage its parents, its educators, its uh, certificated staff, as well as community members to develop a comprehensive plan. And then finally, uh, the services that are in the plan and the resources are to be principally directed at those subgroups that I mentioned previously. So these are our questions for the board this evening. I have them on this slide and I will repeat them at the end of the presentation. Um, we want a input on a process and a timeline for the funding for the unspent money or the new funds that were allocated to us um, from the May revise. There was a change to the board policy policy 0460 in which we're gonna leave our reserve at $1 million so any funding that is not spent above and beyond the $1 million, we need uh, guidance on how we're gonna allocate that funding to ensure that it's principally directed at the targeted students. We um, want your guidance around increased support for our McKinney-Vento students, whether it be some type of systematic progress monitoring or tutoring. Um, I was informed that we did not receive our McKinney-Vento grant from the state of California, and that in the past has funded um, a counselor for the McKinney-Vento, part of that person's um, FTE, as well as tutoring. We um, hire retired teachers to support our McKinney-Vento students. Um, there is a request um, that came up at the stakeholder meetings, and I believe Kathy Campbell spoke to this tonight, for more funding allocated for behavior health services, especially at the TK5 level. Um, we will propose to you a .6 FTE for additional math support at Longfellow, and then the two school welfare and attendance positions to support the African American Success Program. So the new actions and services um, that we proposed in May that received prior approval, one was the point four funding for the U9 math coordinator, and the second one was for a second restorative practices coordinator at Berkeley High School. Those uh, positions, uh, the math coordinator position has been filled, and the uh, RJ coordinator position is in, uh, Principal Swing has um, conducted interviews, and I believe she's making a selection for her second uh, restorative practice coordinator. Uh, we do need approval um, from you for the two uh, welfare and attendance specialist positions. One would be for middle school students, grades seven and eight, and one would focus on students at the high school, ninth and 10th grade. There has been a special request that the uh, position for middle school be housed at Longfellow, but not only support students at Longfellow across the three middle schools with a prioritized caseload, but more of the time could be concentrated at Longfellow. And then the .6 position for math support um, at Longfellow. So based on the recommendations that we received from Alameda County regarding our McKinney-Vento students, uh, we really need to know who our students are and we need to be able to share that information with each of our school sites. Um, we need to establish a strong coordination model so that we know who's um, case managing those students and ensuring that those students are connected with needed resources, whether it be academic, social, emotional, um, or personal needs. Um, that was a challenge as we went through the process with the county, really determining who our students were 
And um, as we went out and visited the schools and we took a list, oftentimes there was a sibling not on the list or a student was no longer at the school. So we just really want to make a commitment from Ed Services and with the new manager coming into student services that we will ensure that we know who the students are, that we have some type of way of assessing their academic needs so that we can create an academic support plan for them and then track them along the way to make sure that they're making progress and as they get to the high school, really ensuring that they're on track to graduate. So there was an ask, what additional supports in LCAP are we providing for Longfellow? And um, so we um, made a recommendation to increase the number, the percentage FTE for response to intervention. This current year, Longfellow receives 0.6. For the 18-19 school year, it has been increased to 1.0. My understanding is that 0.6 will focus on literacy uh, intervention for students, and 0.4 will explicitly focus on math intervention. Um, there is an EL increase. Currently, they receive 0.6. For the new school year, it'll be 0.7. Um, potentially, the school welfare and attendance position will be housed at Longfellow. And then the ask for approval for the additional 0.6 for math support. So based on um, a lot of feedback from the stakeholders, and hopefully you'll have a chance to review the comments and questions that were submitted to Dr. Evans from the PAC, there was a lot of discussion around the need for math support and math intervention, and I think repeatedly the word direct services was shared every time the math discussion came up, and the feeling amongst the parents was we have invested really heavily in literacy support, but they don't feel that we've made the same level of investment in math, and research says that math is the gateway for this generation of students uh, for future employment. So I hope that we'll have a deeper discussion around um, the needs around math in the future. Um, EL students, so um, the, the reclassification process has changed with the new California dashboard. And so once we identify students that are eligible to be reclassified to fluent English proficient, it is now our responsibility to progress monitor them for four years. And so we are going to create um, an online tool that'll be an Illuminate so that the um, sites can continue to progress monitor them, but there may be a need for additional resources, and I believe Denise spoke about it um, in her comments, um, to make sure that those students are continuing to progress, whether it be small intervention groups or um, you know, incorporating them in other interventions that are currently at the school sites. Um, there is also the request around systematic universal screening and progress monitoring. Um, this aligns really nicely with the, the need to address the, I guess, direction that with the dyslexia um, lawsuit where we have to do a universal screening, but how can we build upon that and make sure we continue to monitor our students' progress in a really systematic way? Um, and then you heard it from Ms. Campbell, the need for additional uh, counseling resources. So just a little bit of data. This is one piece of data that was requested at the last LCAP presentation. Um, we delved, uh, delved in deeper to see actually what students are in the AVID program. And so you can see the percentage of student by site um, that are unduplicated. And then you can see the students that are not unduplicated but fall into our other targeted subgroups. And if there's a star, it means that there's less than 11 students, so we don't reveal that. And this is the same type of data. This is for the bridge program at the high school. So last night I had a chance to talk with uh, Principal Swing and I asked her what um, she has envisioned for additional support for the U9 math teachers. And so as you know that you know we're funding a coordinator that's gonna explicitly focus on U9 math instruction. Um, but she said that they're building out a model in which the teachers will collaborate on lessons. They'll review both formative and summative data. They will be creating interventions for students that are struggling. They will develop common assessments, and um, the VP and coordinator will work with the math lead teacher to, to design professional development, 
and the VP and coordinator will be in the math classrooms doing observations, probably the coordinator more. Um, she will be doing formal and informal, informal meaning just daily walkthroughs in the classrooms. And the coordinator will be responsible for evaluating the U9 math teachers. This was the design uh, model that was shared with you a year ago when uh, Associate Superintendent Scuderi first uh, brought to you the idea around the African American project. And um, so I'm sharing this slide with you again. Um, so there's already a BTA school welfare and attendance position that will work with the IS students and BTA. Um, but the ask tonight is that we um, approve two additional school welfare and attendance positions. And you can see to the right um, what his, he envisioned, and I think I can speak a little bit more to it, but he, his vision is that this person will have a prioritized caseload of African American students who may have academic or attendance issues. This person would um, be responsible for connecting with the student, with the school site, as well as with the student's family make frequent visits and uh, contacts with the student, as well as um, potentially connecting the student with a mentor. We're looking to partner with the city and with some other community-based organizations to really um, equip the student with the support, hopefully to move them through our system in a successful way. And then this was his uh, principles of the program and the design, uh, which you have seen before. And I could review it if you want, but basically this would complement the services that we already have at the schools for, for our struggling students. Um, as you know, um, there was a question, well, how does, this how does this impact RJ? How does this work with counseling? Well, this would be a prioritized caseload that we would identify using the data in Illuminate. And um, these students may participate in RJ or they may participate in some other interventions at the school, but this person would be the one that would be supporting them and really building the relationship and connection with the family and also ensuring that the student is attending to uh, the responsibilities of being a scholar and a student. So um, after the May revise, when Assistant Superintendent came back with good news for us, uh, we received $19,000 for the 17-18 school year. Um, and we project that we will have a, about $148,000 unspent this year from the African American Project Manager position, as well as from the Berkeley High support. Um, so that would give us a total of about $167,000. Um, once we close the books, we assume that we will be closer to 190000 For the 18-19 school year, we have $12,000 that is unallocated, and then for the 19-20 school year, about $65,000. So I know that was a lot of information, uh, but I'm going to review the questions again. So we'd like your input on a process and timeline for one-time projects with unspent funds or the new funds. Uh, we'd like to increase support for the MKV students, progress monitoring, tutoring, case management, um, increased allocation towards the TK Behavior Health Services, and, and then the approval of the math support position at, at Longfellow, as well as the two uh, school welfare and attendance positions. And I'd just like to make one comment about the behavior health. Um, it was brought to our attention at the EAC meeting that the behavior health contract, the hourly rates are going up. So if we don't um, allocate additional resources for behavior health, it means that the schools will get a little more service, a little less service, sorry about that. And our LCAP draft that you have, um, I sent it to you electronically. I have a couple hard copies here, is available um, at that link. Um, as well as the draft executive summary, as well as the parent advisory questions. And if anyone out there in the world would like to give us feedback, there's the, the email address, lcap at berkeley.net. Thank you. Great. Thank you for the presentation. Um, let's put a pause on the, actually, no, we can keep the clock running. So at uh, 9.04, we will open the public, uh, public hearing uh, for the draft LCAP. Um, if you'd like to make public comment, you can go to the mic over there. Anyone? <laughs> I can't reach the mic. Oh, okay. 
up here. <laughs> Where? All right, you yeah. can lower it down. Yeah. So say your name, what school you're from. My name is Megan, and I'm from Jefferson. This is my mom, Dominica. And I just want to give a shout out for all the people who came up and said their speeches and told us about something that we probably didn't know. Their sustainability plan. Their sustainability plan. <laughs> Thank you. And so just to put in context, Megan's a first grader at Jefferson Elementary. Um, we are an un unduplicated family, so we fall under several of those categories in LCAP. So the funding really directly impacts us as a family. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? OK. We'll close the public hearing at 9.05. Board comments, uh, direct, Dr. Sadler, if you could pull back up the questions. Okay, um, so if folks could chime in on the various uh, questions for the board, remember that we approve it in two weeks, so um, if we have anything we want to do differently, we should be very explicit at what that would, would be. So, anyone want to go first? Okay, I can go ahead. Try. <laughs> um, I guess the support for McKinney Vento students. And uh, have we looked to what are other school districts doing that have shown and proven um, successful in terms of how they've used their LCAP funds? Um, because I, you know, I know we, we can come up with great ideas, but if some schools have been making progress with their McKinney Vento students, I think that that might help us. Um, the other part is I think the training for our attendants, um, these positions that are being um, considered in terms of attendance for the middle schools. Um, I think the training would be really important in terms of the McKinney-Vento students. And I noticed that we mentioned McKinney-Vento, is it uh, TK to 12, but we're not including our preschoolers. So I don't know if that's if we're also ensuring and making sure that our preschoolers, the McKinney Vento uh, counselor or manager, um, also is including our preschoolers because if they're going, in, some of them are going to our, our own uh, public schools, even if they're not, we should be uh, serving those families. Um, in terms of the timeline, um, I don't know, in terms of the one-time projects that are being unspent with LCAP funds, do we come up with it now? I think sooner than later is, is better um, up front. Um, also, the, in terms of the behavioral health services, a stronger focus on trauma-informed care, a stronger focus on individuals who have that training and capacity to um, train, to support our teachers and how to respond and our counselors. I think a stronger focus on that versus the behavior part, but the trauma-informed care. And so that's Others? Oh, okay, go ahead. Um, thank you, Dr. Sada. Uh, I get so on the unallocated funds, so, um, and we talked about this last meeting in terms of, in terms of what a process would be. Um, since we are in this position pretty much every year where there's a little bit extra money um, and, and, we'll, and we'll continue to have maybe even more now that we've reached the, the reserve mm -hmm. cap, um, I really think it would be great if we could have a, a process earlier on that identified you know, the next, next choice needs, assuming that there's extra money so that it's just part of the regular LCAP process and there's time for the PAC and the EAC to weigh in on what to do with the money, because it it just seems like a um, it doesn't seem right for the for us to sit up here and say, oh, there's 190 thousand dollars, you know, here's here's what I th it should it should come from staff in consultation mm -hmm. with PAC and EAC. Um, I mean, we could I, I guess it would be appropriate for us to say things like, you know, well, um, you know, 
some of what the PAC comments were made sense to me. Some of the, what BFT suggested about behavioral health makes sense to me. Longfellow requested, I know another, I think $6,000 for the summer back program. You know, that seems like a small ask. Um, but I guess the process I would like to see is um, staff coming to us to, saying, here's, you know, here's what we think the best use of this funds are. We've consulted with the stakeholders and it's informed by what they say. They, it's one-time funds. Um, and then we can, you know, approve it. It's just such a short time frame. Like, I, I don't know if we can do that within the next two weeks. Um, if we can't do it in the next two weeks and we do it at the beginning of next year, I just want to make sure, um, consistent with our policy, that, that those funds don't go to the bottom line, that they do get spent mm -hmm. on our unduplicated, primarily on our unduplicated students. So I don't know if you have thoughts about that process. I would, so I guess turning it back to you then, what do you or, or, or you, Dr. Evans, think should be the process? Mm -hmm. So maybe I wasn't clear. Um, I really, I was looking for you all to give us guidance around a timeline, not necessarily actions and services. Um, and I uh, personally feel like we should um, wait until the end of the school year and look at our data and really see where there's a need and then convene our stakeholders there. Um, once you're on PAC, you're on until the end of September. And so we would convene them um, maybe late August and um, share with them our ideas and get their uh, feedback and buy-in and um, then bring it back to the board meeting early fall. So e even though that would mean if it, we wouldn't be spending the money until late fall at the earliest? Well, we don't really have a clear uh, picture of what our total bottom line is until we close the books. So. Okay. Yeah. Director Hill, Vice President Hill. So I think that that's a very procedural way to proceed, so to speak. And the only question that I have is the, the timeliness of providing support to students who need it. And uh, as you know, uh, Director Levy Cutler and I are on the SARB, uh, the Student Attendance Review Board. And um, the need for summer intervention this need for like an early back for early back programs, uh, the need to have maybe a different push for attendance that happens in September as opposed to usually by the time we see SAR students who are who are, you know who you know it's October or November, and you know when that semester is already gone. So I guess while I understand and, and support the need for process, I think waiting until late August you know, may end up meaning that money that could be spent in August or September for an early back or for kind of you know, uh, intervention immediately, not waiting for kids to quote fail, but you know, identifying, you know, let's say the students from Math 1, Math 2 who did not pass or you know, a, a warm handoff from eighth grade. I would really just hate to see that not be able to happen until a year from now because of the process, particularly when it's something that, while it may have not gone through PAC formally, we've certainly, see the, we've certainly seen the community come up and say, the, and talk about the need for those kinds of programs over and over and over and over and over again. And I don't know how we reconcile you know, trying to get something that is uh, in a timely fashion, that's direct services, um, as opposed to going through a process which I, I understand the benefit, but there are some needs that I think have been brought to us in a very community-oriented fashion in terms of, um, you know, it's not just coming from staff, it's not just coming from the board, but it, it's coming from our, our families. Um, so the way I, if I look at this calculations right, we actually have close to 200,000 because it's the money from this year plus an extra 12,000 that's for next year, which would be $200,000. And, you know, I think there's two questions. One of them are, you know, the, the advisory board is an advisory board, so there's some decisions that we can make based on all the input. And then there's like planning ahead for what we're going to do with this remaining 200,000. So what I would suggest is that you, we get a sense from this board of the areas where we do want to prioritize based on the stakeholder feedback coupled with some of the points that you brought, brought up, particularly around McKinney-Vento and, um, uh, and 
I know you've asked for approval kind of for these two new positions, or these new positions, so you can go ahead and hire. Um, and so that's kind of how I would go. And I, and I think that all of them actually look really important. So I would want to know what that would all, what that would cost. So like, for example, you and I spoke the other day about direct services for math intervention, and there might actually be a way to restructure some of the funding that you're already allocating for math coaching to do direct service. That would be one possibility. Or maybe there's another way to give some allocation per site or at a couple of sites as a pilot to figure out. Because I think that direct service for math is something that we've heard, and I like the idea of starting that K through five so that we can look upstream a little bit so then when kids get to the high school, um, you know, we're, we're, right, we're investing in the high school, so I think doing some a little bit upstream is a good idea. Um, I think the, the EL support, I don't know what that costs. I don't know what that would, be, that would involve, but it'd be really interesting to find out. We've heard a lot about that, kids who are reclassified and then, um, and, well, and they tank because they're not getting additional right. support or, Something will emerge. I think you mentioned this, and others have as well. That there's, there might be some other, it, some other learning differences, or mm -hmm. um, some other thing that's going on for the kid that didn't come out because everyone kind of attributed whatever was happening to the fact that to they weren't language. an English language learner. Mm -hmm. Now, we're like, oh well, actually, it's something else. So, I do think that holding, you know, so we don't lose those kids. Um, although it does seem like our English learning, English. I mean, it's very interesting because our data on Latino students who are not English learners is actually keeps get improving. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure how those two things correlate. So I'd want to see the data. Um, the systemic universal screening and progress monitoring, we also had a chance to talk about this. And I think the idea of expanding the pilot that happened this year um, would be very interesting because I think that that could really help us identify needs mm -hmm. as they're happening and help us with target our interventions, which is what it's all about. Um, and then I think I, it's not a surprise, actually, that even though it's last on this list, I would probably put it at the top, the, the need to invest more in mental health services. Um, you know, I know that the discussion here is K through 12, and I, I mean K through 5, and I think that doing that in our elementary schools is a, something we could talk about easily this year. I mean, if I understand you're talking about $3,000 more per site, that's not a lot of money out of the 200000 So what is that, $33,000? So. Mm -hmm. I would say something like that, I would be ready to approve. Um, but it, again, it's a group decision. Um, I think a Director Leva Cutler talked about the McKinney-Vento. That is something that we need to figure out. I think the screening you thought would be a, one way to address that. But um, I also was going to suggest you know, we have this new Pathways program that's just opening up in the city, our new like, navigation center. Mm -hmm. And so I don't know how the city is talking about coordinating with that of that effort that's going on to help homeless people in, in Berkeley. And, you know, so I just think we might need to, I don't know how much has come out of that, the report that we got, but I do think we need to look at the recommendations and particularly since we cut some of those, some, we cut from our, um, our general budget, but. No, since homeless youth are, are one of our targeted, unduplicated students, it seems like this would be a good place to take those, those funds. I'm going to um, jump in a little bit now. So um, I'm on, can you go to the, the money slide? Thank you. So um, this is very helpful, and, and, I, and I think to the point that you raised, Dr. Sadler, when we changed our policy at the last meeting, since we've hit the million dollar supplemental reserve threshold, anything unspent, our policy dictates that we spend it on services for unduplicated students that are one time. Mm -hmm. So I think there is a distinction that we, we want to make between the 167 or whatever that number becomes and the 12,800. So the 12,800 we must allocate in our LCAP in two weeks. It's ongoing and we, we must must. We are, because of how we're choosing to uh, adhere to the requirements to do more, that's, we're choosing to do it by spending more, we must find a purpose, a good purpose for that 12,800. The 167 whatever, the policy doesn't say when you actually have to spend it. It doesn't have to be spent in one year, it just has to be spent on one time. So uh, while I completely agree with, with your point, Director Hemphill, that we, we don't want to leave, we don't want to wait if if we can do something right now. So I think if there are things that 
based upon comments from the EAC and the PAC and from staff's perspective that we could approve in two weeks, I think we'd very much like to entertain that, but knowing that that's not because we have to, but because we don't, we don't want to wait. Yeah. And if we can. Um, I, I'll say the same thing that I've, I've said before. I, I think that when we find, when we have these resources that are sort of unexpected, unplanned, um, there, there is sort of two approaches. One is to sort of divide it up and so it would benefit sort of everyone equally. The other is to really focus it and flood a particular area. And I think this presents us with an opportunity to, to, you know, over a two year period or a one year period, do something really intensive in a very key area, measure outcomes, and then if it's successful, decide, okay, we want to do this on a long term basis. So basically you use this money to fund a pilot. Um, in a very clear area where there's need. I, I have my own personal opinion about what that would be, mm. that's, if that's the strategy we chose. Um, but I think to the point that other d directors have made, um, you know, having that come from the EAC and the PAC and staff makes, I think, the most sense. So that might mean that we bifurcate the spending of one-time dollars. It might mean that there are a couple of key things that you bring to us in two weeks but that the majority of the money is brought forward to us on August 23rd when we have our board meeting in August or even the first meeting in September to allocate. Or even we wait longer if, if there's some value in, in waiting longer, although I think Director Hempel's point, we know there's needs now, so we don't want to wait, wait, wait too long. So just as, as, as one board member, that would be my, my preference would, would be, well, I'm sure there are things that would make an impact sort of divvying it up across, you know, uh, all middle schools or whatever. I, I, I think it's an opportunity to really say, like, pick your need, let's overwhelm it with support, and see if it's actually effective. Because sometimes we surprise ourselves and it's actually not. And that's good to know. Um, so I have a comment on something completely else, but um, are there any other comments on, on this point from any of the board members? Well, I think that that's an interesting, uh, so I think, I you know, you, uh, you're right, this is not, this is consistent with your approach. I think there are some things that I'm hearing, though, that we do know that we need funds from, so whether it's reallocating the current funds, sorry, reallocating the current funds or doing something else, the McKinney-Vento needs we have to meet, we've been told we have to meet, and the mental health, I mean, I think in a year where we've recognized that we have a dearth of mental health services and we're hearing from staff that costs are going up while allocation isn't, that we, you know, there sounds, seems like there's a recommendation for that. So there's a couple things like that where I think they're not new or innovative, they're really like things we need to do. I would rec I think that's great to bring us a recommendation of those things, if it's those or something else. And then, you know, then I would support looking at something that needs an influx of funds. I just. I do also agree that I don't want to have a long, drawn out process because we, I think we kind of know what some of those things are. It's just like, it's the approach for how to, okay, what is, what is direct services on math? What does that mean as far as mm -hmm. actually doing it? Does that mean, you know, how would we do that? And, and I just want to just, I, I will echo and just second what Vice President Pell said. I also think we don't necessarily, since we're talking about one-time funds, need to only think about like a new staff position. I mean, I'm not saying this is the right thing, but like we've been asking about a common math assessment at various points for a long time. You could identify, you know, a stipend to develop a common math assessment that would really allow us to see how our unreplicated students are growing or not. And that's why you would develop it. And I, that could arguably be a, an appropriate use of one-time funds. That's something that we've wanted to do that is not a new position. So I don't think it has to be a new position, but so I think what, I, and if I can try to summarize, I think what we're saying is if we can identify some real needs based upon the feedback we've received from PAC and EAC in two weeks, we'd want, I think we'd be wanting to entertain that, recognizing that that's probably not the entire amount and that anything that is sort of un, unspent remaining, um, you know, that whether it's in August or the first meeting in September, coming back with a more thoughtful and sort of process-oriented recommendation for perhaps targeting a specific problem 
seems to be consistent with what the board is saying on this topic. Has anyone want to object to that summary? All right, Director Levacalli, you've been wanting to chime in and you've been very patient. No, I definitely support the idea of you know, targeting um, funding and doing it sooner. We have um, our summer school. That is mm -hmm. exactly what we have students in the summer right now that are in need of care, perhaps additional tutoring support in the after school that you can bring mentors and tutors to support students after the three hours that they've done to do some additional support. That I think would be, those are the students and we've, a lot of the students that have been in SARB are going to summer school, both in the elementary all the way to the high school. So that might be right now those students who need immediate support and um, from our district. Um, the other part is for me is the, the <clears throat> is the literacy piece that many of our students in math don't get. And I think if we were to also support, make sure that our, it's our math um, coaches include that part and develop that part in terms of how math and literacy are connected and how they can help better support some of our students, who, even our standard English learners who still don't even have that, how we can make sure that those departments are making a connection for our students. So if we can switch to questions for the board. So I think we addressed one, two, and three. Um, are there any, is there anyone who is not comfortable with approving the 0.6 FT for long full math support or the two school and school welfare and attendance positions for four and five? Anyone want to raise concerns about that at this point? Go ahead. So I don't have a, <clears throat> I don't have a problem approving them. I do want to say that the, um, the middle school attendance person, um, I'm just aware that I know that Longfellow has huge needs and there's a part of me that's also concerned that because there were these huge needs and we had a lot of, you know, a lot of outcry about it, that I just want to make sure that we're still keeping an eye. I'm always concerned sometimes when the squeaky wheel gets the grease. Mm -hmm. Is that the thing? Like, I yes. guess, yeah. So, um, I mean, because I, I'm just, uh, and so I guess one of the things that I would want to know before we specifically say that they're going to focus more resources on Longfellow, I, I think I think we got this recently, but I would love to really look at the attendance, the African-American um, attendance data from the three middle schools to and, and allocate that resource that way. Okay. So noted. Okay. So I'm going to shift gears then to the... Uh, no, this is just to push the public hearing. So this is, this is just direction. Um, if you could go to the slide on AVID. So thank you for the updated data on this. Uh, when it came back, when it came to us in the beginning of May, I had expressed concern that the number of unduplicated students at Berkeley High served by that AVID program, at the time the reported data was under 40%. Um, now it's 47%. It, it still very much concerns me that that these are funds intended to primarily benefit unduplicated students, and yet less than half, although it's probably by one student, um, you know, are are students that we believe are unduplicated, so either EL or low income. So um, I looked at the overall amount for AVID grades seven through twelve, and it's two two hundred fifteen thousand. So do you happen to know? how much the Berkeley High portion of AVID costs? So it's a district contract, okay. so it's not broken out, parceled out by school. That's right. So would it be possible to limit it just to the middle schools? Well, so that, that's not really recommended because it's supposed to be preparing students to be college and career ready. Mm -hmm. um, but there is, a, I think I shared before, there is a, push from AVID to really go school-wide and to train all teachers so that the, the strategies are embedded and that everyone um, participates in the preparation with students as opposed to the students having to go to an elective class. And I think that um, that's a better way to go uh, because for students at Berkeley High School, it's just really difficult for them to fit it into their schedule, especially the ones that are in the small schools because there are classes that are required for their particular school theme. Um, so so I, I, I should have, that's a good point, I should have rephrased. 
I shouldn't have said limiting the contract. It makes me uncomfortable that the entire contract, as I understand it, is funded with supplemental funds, given that our Berkeley High portion doesn't serve the students who we need it to serve. But that's not true. It is true. 88% are black and Latino, which but though, are targeted kids. But those are not unduplicated students. Well, we do not fund the teachers who offer the elective courses. They're funded out of general fund. They're out of the base program at the schools. What Abbott, what this allocation does is it pays for professional development, the contract, and the tutors that come from the local colleges and community. So what, 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 what I'm leading up to is suggesting that while we don't change the, the contract, we basically don't, we reduce the amount that is, that is, a, that is billed to supplemental funds, which would impact mm. obviously the base funding, which has an impact. It, it, it would, but that I, it, 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 I am uncomfortable funding a program that at least at, at our, our primary comprehensive of high school doesn't directly serve a majority, a majority of the students that are served by it are not students who are unduplicated. And yes, it's true. 88% of the non-unduplicated students are African American and Latino, but they then are non-low income and non-ELs. And while there's unfortunately a lot of overlap between being of color and being unduplicated in this district, there's not one to one. And we have to be careful that when we have funding that is for a particular student group <clears throat> and for their benefit, that we don't sort of unintentionally have a benefit students who are not in that student group. Dr. Rampa. So I profoundly disagree with that statement and I'll tell you why. First of all, what was the point of us adding African American Latino students to our LCAP plan if we weren't then prepared to spend supplemental funds on that population? Otherwise we would have just stuck with the state's unduplicated target group and not add our own. And if you look at this district, unlike many districts throughout the country, many of the data, much of the data that we've seen have seen very little difference between black students who are low income and black students who are not low income. And quite frankly, in the Bay Area, if you're looking at low income data based upon federal guidelines, you know, you can be over that in Berkeley and not be much better off than a, than, than a family who meets a federal low income. Because if you make as a household 50, you know, up to $100,000 in Alameda County, you are considered to be eligible for uh, subsidized housing. And so to, and I think many of our African American families, um, certainly many of folks that I know, um, they may be making above poverty, but they're not making above a rate that they are housing secure even, much less, you know, and so still, so are not that different than that family that's making $5,000 less, let's say. Um, and so um, I think I argued at one point just being black in this district makes you highly at risk no matter what your income level is. And we've certainly seen that when we see, we, we don't see a big, we see many a graph in which there's very little difference between um, um, those groups. So to me, I mean, that's why I disagree with you. I mean, what, what's the point of adding an African American Latino student as a separate category for not planning on funding um, services for, for, the, for those groups? And I, I really think that many of our students are you know, just over the line or um, certainly um, we're not seeing the difference in achievement on social economics as we um, have seen, that, that are seen nationwide. So I had a similar point. Like I, I was actually, I'm actually a little confused because I guess when you say unduplicated, you're talking about the state's definition of unduplicated. And I do think we made a priority here that the money that we're spending is for, I mean, we added the different categories. And so, for example, hiring more teachers of color is something that's impacting all of the students of, I mean, all the students, but all of the students of color, not just the unduplicated students or a lot of the other indicators. And I think there was a time in this district where we really were looking at the data and saying, oh, really, it, maybe it's more about income than about race. But I think we've learned that, in fact, it's about race and income, but it's about race first. And so I, I think. And so I, um, 
So I have a concern about that. I'm also, on top of that, it's my understanding that AVID is a program mostly for, and there might be some exceptions, but for first-time college First time college yeah, students. So it's uh, for first generation college first generation, students or yeah. students that are from communities that are underrepresented in California colleges. Right. So, um, well, so I guess that would be, but it's, I, I, because I thought it was a larger percent of folks who are first time, first generation college goers, which it by definition kind of, Again, like they're, they're, they, might not, they might not qualify as low income, but they don't come from the kind of privilege that is associated with having parents who are, have higher, higher education and know the system, you know, know all the tricks and everything. So I, I guess that's all to say I disagree with Josh. <laughs> so I, I, I guess I, I will uh, sort of re reframe my argument in an attempt to try to articulate it, which I think doesn't, doesn't I'm not disagreeing with much of, of what was, was said, but you know the, the Berkeley High portion of our AVID cost, let's just say it's $50,000. We're gonna, we're gonna fund that no matter what. We're gonna do it no matter what. It's a good program, we believe in it, we're gonna fund it no matter what. So the question is what bucket of funding should that portion of AVID come from? Should it come from the portion of funding that is dedicated to serving unduplicated students? Or should it come from the bucket of funding that is dedicated to serving all students? And I think in my mind, it's pretty clear that given who is being served in AVID, it should come from the bucket of, of funding that serves all students. Because otherwise, I feel like we're, you know, if, if I had that $50,000, this is not the program that I would invest in just to benefit my duplicated students, purely because there's not enough of my low-income student and EL students in the program. So it's not, it's not a judgment on the value of the program. It's a, it's, it's a commentary on, on what funding source should be used to fund it and what is the most appropriate use of those funds. So I'm not sure I'll convince anyone, but I, I, if it was up to me, we, we would fund this out of base, not us, out of supplemental. Well, again, I ask you, why did we go through the process of including Latino and African American as a, core, as a category of students to be funded with LCAP money if we're then not going to use LCAP money to serve those students? We, we have to. The, the LCAP requires us to, to, to call out uh, different student groups, including black and African American and Latino. So every LCAP in the state calls out different student groups. We, we have agreed, I agree with you, we've identified these student groups as needing additional support, 100% agree, but the funding that we get from the state, and I, I don't, I don't, there is a bill that would, that would change it, would make it a lot better. So I'm not, I'm not, but this money, if we have students who are low income and students who are not, even if they're on the cusp, the students who are low income in my book, by definition, all those being equal, need that resource more. So that's not what our student outcomes say if you're black in this no, district. No, no, no. All else being equal. So a low-income black family versus a, low in, a non-low-income black family, the low-income black family needs the support more. If the outcomes are the same, why is there a difference in need? I, I, I guess I think by definition, I, I, don't, I don't think the, the need is the same because of the, of the low-income status. I, I don't know how else to say it. I so I don't, I mean, I'm not... I'm looking at time, we're 20 minutes over. I think over. we should probably move on, because I... We well, no, I'm, 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 I'm... I had a question in terms of, yeah. how is universal ninth grade going to address this? Is, is this, do you see that this would change with, with the universal ninth grade? Yes, yeah, so we're very hopeful. Um, Mary Patterson, who is the teacher, who is one of our district directors around Abbott, has been over and has met with the U9 leads. She's, um, we've also sent several of them to Abbott Summer Institute, and we're taking 25 teachers to Abbott Summer to Institute in June, and I believe five of them are from Berkeley High School. So it's about outreach. It's also about working closely with the counselors at Berkeley High School so that they will encourage students to continue on the path with Abbott. A lot of students are interested at middle school, and when they get to high school, there's so many options, or it's so limited that they can't fit it in their schedule. So I think we just have to do a better job of building that pathway for them. So is, is there a, where are the, the three of you all at in terms of this debate? Are you comfortable as is? Are you more in favor of 
having it that portion funded by base funds. I'm comfortable as it is, but can I just ask a question of Dr. Sam? I'm just looking at the numbers. Can you just explain what it, the number, the looks like 45 unduplicated work that kids and 24 unduplicated. So I'm, I'm just missing something. Why is it 47%? Isn't 45? Oh, double? it's, um, it's 47% 47. of the 45. 47% uh, of the students in Avid are unduplicated. The 88% is of non-unduplicated students. They're two different percentages. So there's 21, there's 21 unduplicated students and Mike. 24 uh, unduplicated. Yeah. I mean, uh, yeah. yeah. So, so there are 40, 45 students at Berkeley High are in Avid. Of those 45, 21 or 47%, are unduplicated. Right. The other 24, this is exactly what you said. Are, exactly. are not unduplicated. <clears throat> but they're African American or Latino. 88% of the 24. Are okay. What I can give you a the, math what, lesson after. What, what percent of the whole AVID cohort is unduplicated? 47%. No, in the across K, uh, 7, 12. Uh, we have not tallied that number, but I can bring it back to you or put it in Friday notes. Well, I, t for me, it, it, it's sort of unnecessary to resolve the debate between Director Hempel and President Daniels because overall, the, the well over 50% of the students are unduplicated. And so that's why I feel comfortable. You could parse it out by school and say maybe one's not over 50%. I get both the points that have been made, but to, to me, a majority, a strong majority are unduplicated, and that's enough to make me feel comfortable. And there is another um, AVID um, pathway, and it's for our long-term ELs at the middle school. It's called AVID Excel, and they are not included in this. And I would assume that they're about 90% unduplicated students. Impot? Yes. 60, 64%. Yes. 60, so 64% of all AVID students are unduplicated. So from, from this seven. group there, yes. If you look at this group and you do the weighted averages of the unduplicated percentages, it's 64%. Okay. So I appreciate the comments, but I'm comfortable with it. Yeah, and the AVID Excel, I'm sorry, I didn't include this in the slide, but the AVID Excel um, courses at the middle schools are also included in the overall contract. Okay. So All right, so I think we're good then to move on. Any other comments on the LCAP? Okay, thank you both very much. Did you get everything you need? So are the two uh, items approved? Well, it, it sounds like we can't approve them. They're not officially approved. We're not reason. voting on it today. It wasn't. A, it was a discussion no, item. We were hoping. Okay. It wasn't listed as an action item, so we didn't present it in that way. But yeah. President Daniels, can we can we provide direction that we're comfortable with enough of those positions that they can start the hiring process? No. Not even the math for Longfellow. I, it's not an action yeah, that's item. That's fine. I mean. It, 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 it wasn't listed as an action item. It'll come back in two weeks for approval. If we needed to take action, it should be listed as an action item. And, and that, was not, that was not communicated to me as, as being needed. So we have a process in our policy that talks about it. We, we did that a few weeks ago where we did take action. We can't do it tonight. OK. All right, uh, let's, let's take a five minute banana break. We'll come back, we'll jump ahead, we'll do our trivia, and then we'll hop back to the budget.
stations out there. For some reason, I can't right now. The thing just froze. Oh, that's what's happening. Yeah. Thanks for the batteries. Yeah. The thing is. Froze as soon as you uh, so, so that's what caused the problem. That's what caused the problem. I was using those half good batteries. Yeah, yeah, a wired, a hard wired mouse and a keyboard. Yes, that's you. <laughs> well, you have to call Jay. Yeah. And it's getting hot. If we could get some ice cube trays for the next <laughs> Right? Ice cube trays. All right, Liz, you ready? Who are we missing? Isn't he? I, heard, I smell the bananas. He's back. All right. All right, so let's do this. We have many people here waiting in anticipation of the answers to this question. All right, don't jump ahead too fast. Okay. Keep going. Now, this is the question. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going, positive, nice and slow. All right, one more, one more. Okay, stop. All right, question number one. In what grade do Berkeley students not formally study the history of the United States, second, fifth, eighth, or 11th? Would anyone here like to answer that question? Have to come to the podium. Actually, it's okay. It's not the right, it's, it's not the right answer, so I won't make you come and get it wrong. All right. Eighth is not the right one. No, you got. No, fifth. Anyone? Oh, U.S. 
director Nagarajan Swenson in her farewell debut has it correct. It's the second grade. I mean, I didn't really have a flag card after everyone else. Hey, just, just take your victory, okay? All right, button. I played with animation a little bit. Second grade is the answer. All right, question number two. With respect to reading information texts, in what grade are Berkeley students expected to distinguish their own point of view from that of the author of a text? I thought this was a really interesting sort of, sort of cognitive developmental step. And at what grade would we expect someone to do that? I don't want to wager a guess. Fifth. I hear a fifth. Anyone else? It's a pretty good guess, a little high. A little high. Director Level Keller has it right. Third grade. Yeah, I, was, I thought I was surprised by that. That that's a. Although, listen to these kids. Okay, I know it's true. All right, so the, here's a math problem uh, around approximation and uh, a number times ten to whatever. Um, what what grade do we expect um, a Berkeley student to answer the following math problem? What does it feel like? Natalie? Seventh. Ooh, almost. Very good. Eighth grade. Yeah. So, and then the next one is extra credit. Um, anyone want to take a wager at what the answer to that math problem is? 15 times larger. 20. No, 25, actually. <laughs> 25. 25. Close to 25? All right. No. Because it's 18 and 8 and 9. But it's to the 8th and to the 9th, so it's some 10 value larger. And then it's 3 and 7, so it's probably See, this is what the Common Core state standards elicit, is the discussion and the I understanding. I did Common Core. I was in the last grade before we got it. Fair enough. So the answer is 20 times larger. Go ahead. And the reason is because the way that it's, it's formulated allows you to answer it, but 7 is a little more than two times larger than three, closer to two than to two and a half. And 10 to the ninth is 10 times larger than 10 to the eighth by the power. So multiplying two by 10 gives you 20. So 20 is the, is the larger estimate. Yeah, it was, this was a hard one. But uh, we, we, we need more instruction focused trivia questions anyway. So this was what we're here to do. All right. Um, Assistant Superintendent for Business Services, Follinsby. Budget. Do you want to do an introduction, Superintendent? I had not planned on doing that. All right, no worries. Just turn it over. Just turn it over. Go, go forth, please. Oh, yes. Yeah, oh, no. So, good evening, board members and Superintendent. I'll be. Um, the 1819th preliminary budget tonight. And first, the budget highlights. Um, the budget's built on the, the governor's May revised budget, and, um, and that ha pro projected or proposed full funding for the LCFF um, funding as well as um, for the rainy day budget reserve. Um, he increased the, the ADA per the funding per AD is up from the January revised from 295 to 344. Um, the COLA is now 3% for LCFF and 2.71 for other programs. And the budget incorporates all board approved budget priorities and reductions for 1819. And as it relates to Berkeley, we have a positive certification, which means we're able to meet our obligations in the current year and the two subsequent years. Um, we have an undesignated fund balance of $2.3 million, and that's after designations of $1.2 million. We have an ending fund balance of $3.5 million. And since the estimated actuals, we have an increase of $3.4 million. Um, another note has to do with our contribution to special ed. Um, at second interim, and before we actually did the estimated actuals, we were projecting an increase of a million dollars to the special ed fund. 
We estimated that amount to be about $800,000. So that amount is, has been put in the estimated actuals. And then um, for 18-19, we have an additional $0.1 million contribution, which you'll see later on in the presentation. So when we're looking at the changes between estimated actuals and the 18-19 budget, um, the major changes ha has to do with our revenues. Um, our revenues came in significantly higher than the estimated actuals. Um, our ADA was up 4.1 million and our increase in one-time discretionary funding, $1.9 million. That's about a $6 million increase over estimated actuals. When we looked at our expenses, um, we had increases in salaries and in our benefits, and there was an, un an unusual um, correlation in our benefits. Um, even though our salaries and benefits went up by 1.5%, our health benefits actually went up by $2.2 million, and including our LC, our, our PERS and STIRS, and that's because we assume that all the positions are filled and that all employees will have um, health and welfare costs. So that's just an unusual correlation. We also had savings in our books and supplies. We had um, board approved cuts, and then we also had one-time buses in the prior year that we don't have in the current year. So you can see our, um, our change in expenses was $3 million, and that's actually an increase in expenses, which would be a use. Um, we also had other changes in our contribution, and that had to do with board-approved reductions in transfers to the Older Adults Program, our preschool program, and the cafeteria fund. And we received more in, from BCEP as a, reduce, as a result of increased enrollment and increase in re release time. But then we talked about the increase of special education. That's the point one million that I mentioned earlier. So um, in all, we had about a $3.5 million increase um, from estimated actuals to the estimated budget, to the preliminary budget, and that's predominantly driven by the increase in revenues, the $6 million increase in revenues that's driving that amount. So in terms of um, the multi-year projections, this next slide is just a graphic representation that I shared with you um, when we did the May revise. I just thought it was helpful to see the year-over-year -year increases in supplemental and in base funding. And then this is a slide that's pretty familiar to everybody, and I'll spend a little bit of time on this. Um, this now has the 1819 um, multi-year projections with 1920 and 2021 before we had estimates and um, it's interesting that our change in fund balance is pretty close to what we estimated for. So in terms of um, the assumptions you can see the COLA, the 3% that we talked about um, and 1920 the assumptions for the COLA and then the gap funding we're at 100% gap closure which, we, which I also mentioned earlier. Um, in terms of um, other state funding, which is halfway down the page, you can see the $5 million um, went down to $1.8 million, and that's because of the prior, one, prior year one-time funding was removed. Um, in terms of expenditures, um, the $92.1 million in expenditures and the 94.5 in the out years, that does not include salary increases, so we need to, bear, to um, take that into account. 1819 has in the 1% um, on schedule increase and a 1.5% um, bonus, which was negotiated. Um, the next slide shows the change in fund balance, which is our beginning point for looking at our deficit. So when, we, um, when I brought the slide earlier, these numbers were pretty close. So we thought we'd have a change in fund balance of 0.7 for 1819, and we're spot on. Um, 1920, a deficit 0.8, and a million in 2021. When you look at our beginning fund balances, you can see we're projecting ending fund balance of 3.5 for 1819, 2.7 for 1920, and 1.7 for 2021. 
our designations are listed there, or our assignments, and that's for um, our supplemental grant for LCAP, which is in accordance with our board policy. So bottom line, our ending fund balance, which is undesignated, is 2.3 million, 1.5 million, and 0.5 million for the O heirs. So you can see the decrease in our balance, and we need to, at some point, we have to address um, you know, cuts for 1920 and 2021, which we'll discuss later on in the presentation. And that's just a, um, a summary of what we talked about before. And this is another graphic representation of our ending fund balances over several years. Um, the third bar from the right, there's that spike. It's a little bit higher. And remember, we've made $1.8 million in cuts, and that's helping that fund balance overall. And you can see the, the decline in the O years, which would need to be addressed. Um, our deficit and our surplus. Um, the beginning point was that line in our multi-year projections where we had a surplus of, in, of 0 0.7 in 1819 um, in and um, we're deficit spending in 1920 and 2021. Um, for us to get our structural deficit, we have to remove one-time revenues and one-time expenditures. So you can see that um, that should actually be a surplus because they're all negatives, but we do have, oh no, wait, there are, Deficit, sorry. So we have $44,000 in 1819, 803 in 1920, and 889 in 2021. And one times, as a reminder, um, it's on this slide here. This is a laundry list of items that the board approved, and the 1.5% bonus is actually um, in 1819. That would be removed from one time expenses um, to get the deficit. So in all, um, the board approved um, $2.5 million in one-time expenses, and in 2021, it was $67,000. Other considerations, um, we, we keep talking about the increase in pension costs, and that's absorbing a lot of the increased revenue, and that's also increasing our structural deficit. Um, we do have to face bu balancing the budget in 1920 and possibly 2021. Um, that would mean that our, the SBAC, the Superintendent's Budget, budget Advisory Committee, would need to reconvene um, to address budget reductions. Um, I, as I mentioned earlier, future negotiated um, increases are not included in the outiers in the multi-year projections, and then we have to take into account two of our funds, which are pretty much um, very close to being, they're barely balanced. And that's our food services and our child development fund. We did a lot of steps to try and ensure that they would be balanced. But as you can see, the preliminary budget has a $27,000 balance for food services and child development ended with $6,000. And um, we also have to be aware of the governor's caution. Um, he keeps pr projecting the, um, well, he won't be here next year, but um, a recession is always, um, he always focuses on the impact of a recession and his caution is what goes up must come down. So we need to be careful of that. And this other section talks about the public hearing reserve disclosure requirement and that's straight from our Alameda County. We have to look at the minimum reserve required for the two years, two subsequent years, and then look at our fund balance, both assigned and unassigned, that exceeds that minimum in each year, and then we have to provide an explanation. So this slide kind of does all of that. We looked at the assigned and unassigned balances for the out years, the, the current and two subsequent years, and then we, have, we added the fund 17, which is our reserve to that. And then um, we looked at the 3% reserve, which is um, in the middle of the slide there, the amount in excess, 9.7 million, 10.6 million, and 11.8 million. These numbers are significantly different from last year, and we're in like in the hundreds of thousands and rapidly de decreasing, and that's because of BSAP. Um, BSAP has $6 million of that excess amount that's attributable to the BSAP fund balance, as is the 7.7 and the 9 million in the old years. Um, the LCAP reserve, we're setting some of that aside for um, our LCAP reserve, and then 
in terms of the balance that's, um, that's basically to pro protect pro programs and prudent fiscal um, responsibility. So next steps, um, we're doing the preliminary budget and the LCAP tonight with the public hearing. Um, the next, at the next board meeting, we'll be approving the LCAP and the final budget. Um, but remember, this budget's based on the May revise and the governor's enacted budget isn't until the summer 2018. So to the extent that we have significant changes, we'll do a 45-day revise um, if needed. And of course, we'll be starting the process of budget reductions um, for 1920. And questions. All right, thank you. So this is a public hearing for our 1819 budget. I'll open the hearing at 10.05. Everyone who's in the audience can line up. Whoa. <laughs> All right, we're gonna close the hearing at 10.05. Um, questions? Let's, let's first talk, uh, ask questions about sort of the substance of the presentation, but then we will get to this question around future budget reductions. But are there any questions? Yeah, go ahead. Not a question, but a clarification, which I think you brought up in the beginning, but I just wanted to make sure everyone caught, which is that what you had heard was that the, um, the budget that's being recommended out of the conference committee actually reduces the one-time funding by a million dollars and um, increased the amount of, um, of the L LCF L LCFF base funding. Right, um, we, we actually got more clarification. School oh, yeah. services came out um, with the 3.7% um, proposed COLA. That's what they think it's gonna be, but they haven't come up with a reduction in the one-time funding. But we think it's gonna be a trade-off but to the extent um, that it's a significant change, we'll bring it back in the 45-day revise. Just so people recognize that that would be, if it, even if it's the same, it means it's the same ongoing right. instead of one, one time, time. Which is better for, the, for our budget. Other comments, questions? Okay, so at the last, meeting when we discussed, was that our last, on the 30th, right? Mm -hmm. We discussed the May revise update, and at that meeting the board uh, sort of gave general direction that it wanted to explore, sort of go down the route of future reductions for 1920, perfect, um, and beyond. We said at that meeting that at this one we would be talking about sort of scale and scope if we can sort of get there and then in two weeks we would potentially ask if assuming we can agree on a number or two for a, a proposed timeline um, that we would sort of generally agree to in terms of how the SBA would operate, when it would come back to the board, etc. Um, so I'm going to throw out there that you know even if we didn't have um, you know, compensation or lack of compensation written in here that we already have a structural deficit of between 800,000 and a million dollars, depending upon sort of how you slice and dice it. Right. So, you know, and, and, and I think fiscal prudence would dictate that you don't just, you know, solve just to zero, but you yeah. solve beyond that because yeah. there's going to be, um, situations that you don't anticipate, be they local, be they state. This doesn't include any new expenses. Um, so I would encourage us to, even if we don't end up agreeing to make reductions of this amount, to set as a potential target either a couple of thresholds, maybe a million dollars and two million dollars, or 1.5 and two, but to, to look in the two range as a goal, recognizing that unlike this past year when we really needed to hit 1.8, Mm -hmm. We could not hit two and still be okay, but it would mean that we would have much less flexibility in, in what we do as a district. So I think depending, I mean, we have to sort of craft the direction the right way, but I would encourage us to direct staff to, you know, work with the SBAC to propose a list of up to two million, um, recognizing that we may not actually use all, you know, a, adopt all two, but sort of set that as the, as the goal and, and see how close we, we can get if, if the future board decides to, to do that. So that's just, that's my, my offer, but I'm curious to know where 
whether uh, where, uh, where other board members are at. I like, I mean, I definitely uh, like the idea of early on having a conversation with uh, the advisory committee. Um, but I'd like to have it like, what does one million look like, and what does one point five, and what does mm -hmm. two million look like, versus just all in one bucket? Because um, these, you know, in terms of what what would what's being suggested or recommended, perhaps to look at in terms of reducing. Um, so we can we can see. I mean, it's a serious thing to look at, but it's also something looking out into 2021, scary to look at what would be 2122 yeah. if we continue this route. So. Well, I will say that it's definitely going to be incredibly challenging uh, when we just cut, you know, close to as what we could for 1.8. Yeah. So you can imagine um, what 1.5 or 2 million might be like for us next year. Um, but we can um, do our very best if that's so. If that's the board's um, direction um, for us, um, we can look into that and provide that. So, if I understood what you're suggesting, Director Levicolor, so what we did last time was we said we, our target to cut is 1.8 million, but we want 2.1 million worth of correct suggestions so that we have some. Mm -hmm. We can choices. Um, so is that what you meant? Like so, yes, so right. to say, to take President Daniel's suggestion, two million dollars is well. Uh, we could say, or to take your suggestions, one million dollars. But we'd like to see um, one point five or two. Um, how does it change this to doing a one million cut? What? How would it change this? What would one point five? What would this scenario, this multi-year projection, what would what oh. would it look like? So I was thinking that we would do it almost like we did this year. The board like, would give, oops. The board would say, okay, like you said, I'm saying two million dollars, and we would provide two million dollars. But you would, but really, you might want us to cut like 1.5 million, and that would give you the flexibility to choose from the items that we are suggesting or we're recommending. But what I, what I, so now I, Director Lyrico is asking something different than what I thought, which is uh, what, what would the multi-year projections look like if we made those cuts, which, which right. should be oh. pretty easy to, to, to generate, I think. Um, I could bring Because back. it's not just about cutting, but it's also, you know, what, what would be the ending fund balance that we would be comfortable, that the district would be comfortable with. It's not just about the cut, but it's just looking at the mm -hmm. ending number. What will we be comfortable with living with? It's, it's not just cut, 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 and then get to 2 million or 1.5. So, so what we've done in the past, we've looked at the, um, the actual deficit, um, the change in fund balance. And if, if we get to a point, because to the extent that we're deficit spending, we're kind of spending down your savings account, if you will. So we want to be prudent in terms of um, kind of like making sure our savings um, would be there for some years. Yeah, so it's really how much more than balanced would we want to get to? Yeah, I mean, I think I agree with both of you. I mean, I, I think that we should ask for two million and then see where we're going to go. I, you know, I think one of the things that's a big unknown is we have no idea what the new governor is going to be. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think people, we were talking about this in the audit committee meeting and, you know, hoping that the new governor is maybe a little more generous. Um, and maybe someone will do something about this CalPERS. Per I mean, there's some right. things that could be addressed that could put more mm -hmm. money in our coffers. But I think in the short term, not, we won't know that until next year's budget process. So right. I think, um, or maybe we'll have an idea during the um, legislative, um, uh, the legislative season. But, um, but I think to start off with, that number sounds to me like a reasonable like we don't have, and we don't again have to make two millions mm -hmm. of cuts. But I think we, I mean, it's going to be hard. Like Donald was, Superintendent Evans was saying, we just did this, and it was it painful. Was so yeah. we're going to have to look the next level down. All right. But you know, regardless, I think we want to make sure that we do have some flexibility to make decisions in the upcoming years. Okay. 
-hmm. So, um, as you know, I disagree with the strategy, but I'm obviously outnumbered, so <laughs> I was just going to keep quiet. So we'll come back uh, in two weeks, and um, one of the things, maybe it might be a separate item, not to confuse it with the approval of the budget, mm -hmm. that would include a timeline and some more explicit language around what we're asking the SBAC to do. Okay. Um, and so that... I'm thinking will be a, probably a separate item at the next board meeting okay. um, that will probably be for action. Again, we're not going to be approving cuts. <laughs> we're just mm -hmm. approving a process that could result in cuts. Um, but I think given that it's a large number and we want to make sure that, you know, folks are on record in, in terms of making sure that, that we're clear what, we're, what the board is directing of staff, that okay. it comes from the board. Okay. All right, anything else on this item? Okay, thank you very much. Sure. <clears throat> okay, moving on to item number 16, adoption of phonics phonemic awareness program for, grade, for grades K through three. This is a... No, it's a discussion. It's a discussion. Yeah, we bring it back at the next one as an action item. So I'm actually gonna introduce this item. Uh, you ready? Director Riddle. <laughs> so um, this is something that I've noticed um, since I've gotten here, since I've been here. Um, our current program is TCRWP, which is Teachers Reading Writing Project. Um, our program does a very good job um, of with some pieces of a systematic reading program, but one of the pieces that the program lacks is a phonics piece of the program, which is essential when kids are learning how to read. Um, so we started this process uh, earlier this year, um, led by Director um, Riddle, and um, we've met several times. We've actually piloted a couple of programs um, and so we've actually finally come to a decision um, with the program that we think that would best meet the needs of our students. And so I'm going to turn it over to um, our director um, to explain um, the adoption process. Okay. So um, in the board doc that I already submitted to you, you have a lot of the background information, including links to this actual program and other information. And in an earlier presentation, um, we talked with you about the structured literacy program. And Dr. Evans um, brought up just moments ago that our current program, that's our longstanding English language arts program for elementary teachers college reading and writing project, has many components that support the development of reading, but one of the most important components to support the development of reading is phonics and phonemic awareness, and that is lacking from the program that we currently have. And when I say that, I'm talking about explicit instruction in phonics and phonemic awareness. Um, so tonight, I'm just going to take you through a few slides on uh, what our process has been in identifying what we think will be an um, additional program for Berkeley Unified that will support that goal. So Liz, I've never done this one, there we go. So as you know, one of our goals for our Berkeley 2020 plan, uh, the vision is that all children will read proficiently by the end of third grade. Now research really supports the um, understanding that if students are not reading proficiently by the end of third grade, there is a chance that in their career of, of being a reader that they will never reach grade level proficiency. So that gives us a dire responsibility to make sure that that in Berkeley Unified, we figure that out and make sure that we're doing our best work to ensure that all kids are readers. So this year, we embarked on a phonics program adoption process, and we initially brought forward all of these programs. I think there's eight or nine up there. And um, we looked at those particular programs either because staff recommended them or they were being used in other districts, or um, they were, we found out about them in a variety of different ways. So on November 13th and 14th, we had an open house down here at the uh, district office, and folks came through uh, who were invited, everyone basically 
Berkeley and elementary school staff were invited and came through and looked at all the programs. And then on January 29th, I led a larger group in a workshop at the Staff Development Day to not only review the programs that we were considering, but also to learn more about structured literacy and what that means in bringing explicit phonics to, um, to our TCRWB program. So those were all the initial programs. The following people previewed these programs, principals, district administrators, classroom teachers, lit coaches, RTI teachers, special ed staff, and of course the PD department, TSAs. Uh, staff ranked the programs during these preview days, and Ed Services then took a look at all of the rankings, and we selected three programs for um, pilot. Now, one, or, one of those programs wasn't on the initial list, but in looking at um, recommendations from the internet National Dyslexia Association and from folks who are experts in structured literacy, uh, we added on GoPhonics. So the pilots were off and running um, in January through May. 33 classroom teachers in grades K through three piloted these three programs. Fast Track Phonics, which is a product of Success for All, which is a nonprofit group focused on excellence and in instruction. Go Phonics and Wilson Foundations, um, that is a part of a multi-program um, in reading supports. All three programs are uh, supported and approved by a IDA, and all three programs are explicit phonics. And I, I make that point because there are other programs that call themselves phonics and phonemic awareness programs, but there's a big difference between an explicit program and some of the other programs that we looked at um, but did not choose. So following that process, we held a debrief meeting on May 14th, and attending were 15 piloting teachers, eight lit coaches, seven principals, Dr. Evans, uh, Pasquale Scuderi, myself, and Suzanne Reed, our PD coordinator, and uh, uh, union representatives. It was a very lively meeting, um, very, very lively. We had all of the materials out in table groups, and we had facilitated desktop uh, conversations about them. And this is how we collected feedback. And this is not everything we did to collect feedback. As you know, I spent a lot of my time in schools talking to staff, talking to teachers, visiting classrooms, and I did that in addition to talk to teachers and principals. But we surveyed the piloting teachers, surveyed the observing teachers, which in some cases were lit coaches or RTI uh, teachers. We did the facilitated table talks. And at the end of the meeting, we had a lively whole group comment period. Uh, we gave everyone a ranking form, and we also held many discussions in principals' meetings. So our recommendations from Ed Services after reviewing all of this input, which was extensive, is that we believe that the Fast Track Phonics program is a good choice for Berkeley Unified. It does uh, is based on explicit phonics instruction for K-3 students. It's easy to use and teacher friendly. The lessons are short, 20 to 30 minutes a day. We can integrate it with TCRWP. So it's not simply a standalone program, but to strengthen TCRWP in areas such as shared reading and shared writing. Um, it provides excellent professional development, which I'll go into at our, our next uh, meeting if, if this is the program we go forward with. And the assessments are built into the program, which means we would be able to streamline some other assessments and use those connected with the program. So that's our recommendation. This is our timeline that will order by July 2nd. We're already um, doing the paperwork to, to get the numbers on every classroom. We'll start summer professional development, which will be uh, voluntary because that's not a, a day when staff are required to come. But we will reach out to all of the folks that you see there to come to this initial day. But we will also start with training our lit coaches so that on the first staff development day, which is August 23rd, the lit coaches and the principals will lead professional development with all 11 elementary sites at their first day meeting. Then October 9th is our first staff development day, and that day will be totally devoted to this program, uh, PD for grades K through three, lit coaches, RTI, and special ed, and then the same on January 29th. And in addition, we do hold model classrooms for TCRWP, and this year our focus is going to be on phonics and phonics 
hyponemic awareness. And of course, as is always the case, we do professional development all year long with Wednesday staff meetings. And if we, if we adopt a uh, fast track, uh, success for all, we will have a year long coaching relationship with them in person at the 11 sites and by uh, webinars. So just to leave you with a couple of um, important points, and that is that if you can get a kid reading, they're going to be successful in everything they do at school. Hopefully that is really true for us, and we need to make improvements in this area so that every one of our kids uh, will be a proficient reader, and I believe 100% that we can do that. And that is the presentation. Awesome. Well. Efficient to the point. <laughs> like it. All right. Questions, comments? Questions. Thank you. Um, learning more about this. How, um, and I asked this question before in, in my notes, in terms of how this is going to interface with our English language learners and their learning to read, is there a similar program for those students? Um, well, actually, there's so many things that we're doing that are not just this particular phonics program. Like, I, I think you're probably aware that this year we trained 28 staff members in the Slingerland methodology, which is a phonics phonemic awareness methodology, not a program, but that really dissects the English language. And that program is highly successful for English language learners. And it's also successful for kids who are not just English language learners, but for kids who um, are learning another language as well. In the short time that we've been training in that methodology, taking it back to the sites, we have already seen, in some cases, a dramatic change in reading. But in addition, schools such as um, to the TWI school, uh, Sylvia Mendez, we are adopting a different phonics program in Spanish, and we're working with staff, I am, and uh, we're looking at, for example, right now, a National Geographic phonics program, which is one of the only elementary programs in Spanish. So we will have both. We'll have this program in tier one in the general ed classroom in English, and at LeConte and at uh, Thousand Oaks for those remaining classes, uh, we'll be looking at the National Geographic or a similar, a similar program. So uh, this is for just K to third. What happens to our students who fourth and twelfth, who ha are still struggling and um, have are identified? Uh, well, I think that that's a huge issue for us because we have not had this kind of programming in place. And while we've made some gains, and in some cases really big gains, even this year if we look at the data from this year, we still will have to go back and look at how those students in the upper grades are doing with reading. And we have some assessments in place right now, but we will in the fall bring in a universal screener, and that will show us much more clearly what those particular students are actually struggling struggling with, and then we'll work with tier two programming to address those needs. But in the, in the, since this is a K-3 program, we also do need a 4-5 program that would be different. It wouldn't be a phonics and phonemic awareness program, but a program that's more focused on vocabulary and grammar. And last question, how can we early train also our teachers who will be in summer school next year in 19? In, in this training, so they're also trained in it because not all of our teachers do the summer school training, but I don't know, traditionally you have the same teachers, but making sure that those teachers are also part of this training. Uh, luckily, this particular program, Fast Track, has really extensive online training, so I think it'll be pretty easy for us to facilitate that. And we can also begin training classified staff as well. Go ahead. I will, I am sure at the end of the day that I will, well, I'm not sure. I will probably at the end of the day approve this curriculum. And if I do, it'll be because we desperately need phonics in our schools. I would much rather take a much critical look of why we're continuing to use TRWP. It has for several years when it comes to our unduplicated students and African American students has not resulted in positive outcomes and in fact there were negative outcomes. Students were falling behind, not gaining. 
We also now have been, as many districts have been across the country, um, been told that a phonics-based based curriculum is imperative for students who have dyslexia. And so to me, I don't understand, I don't agree with the strategy of patching a program that is a whole language program to include phonics, because I think then you're asking teachers to know two curriculums as opposed to one. And it's been an ongoing issue to have enough professional development consistently um, as opposed to once a year or every other year because of all the different issues that we want to support our, stu our, our teachers in knowing because you know what we're asking teachers only grows, it doesn't diminish. So I really don't think having to learn two different literacy programs, one of which we've not had the outcomes for our targeted students and some of our special education students with the limited PD time that we have, as opposed to focusing on one, and to coin a phrase from uh, Director Daniels, and flooding that with appropriate um, resources. So I kind of look at adding this program as keeping a, prog a math program that's focusing on kids knowing, uh, saying that one plus one equals two when they have no idea what one means as a concept. And then deciding after they've been learning one, one plus one equals two without knowing what one means is, oh, well now we're gonna tell you what one means to, you know, down the road. So this is the issue that I have. I, I, I don't think it's a wise strategy to pile up programs as opposed to finding the one program that provides the pedagogy that we have seen our students need. Well, I can't say that I'm in disagreement with you across the board on that, but I do think that right now what we need to do is bring in an explicit phonics program, and I don't necessarily see it as separate, because any program that we brought in, if we were to bring in a program instead of TCRWP, that piece would have to be learned, and our staff, that's not what their highest level of understanding is, phonics and phonemic awareness. So I'm not in disagreement with you that there are programs out there that are more inclusive of all of the components of reading. Um, but I do feel that right at this juncture in time that it is imperative that we bring in a phonics program and bring it into tier one as an access and equity point for all students. And in addition to this programming, it's certainly not all we're doing. We do have other programming and training in place through the structured literacy approach that should begin to integrate other ways of thinking and, and teaching and literacy into TCRWP as well. well. I'll just end with saying is, you know, <clears throat> I would hope that a future board um, at some point evaluates the efficacy of continuing with uh, a TRWCP as opposed to putting in, uh, adding in supplemental uh, phonics program. Uh, TRWC, in fact, has a phonics component. So the fact that we are finding the need to go out and get another one, to me, just says a lot more about how, while I understand that there's a, many things to like about that program, its lack of being phonics-based, I think, is a real issue. And I, don't, it, I, I do think that in the 12 years I've been here, we rarely eliminate programs Instead, we add on, and I think sometimes if it if it's broke, it's broke, mm -hmm. and it needs to be replaced, not patched up. Mm -hmm. um, TCRWP just came out with the phonics program right now, and um, it's actually not complete, and it is not an explicit phonics program, which is why it's not under consideration for us. Okay, you just, just made just my point. Yeah, recognizing that we have twenty six minutes and four more items. I just wanted to say that I, um, <clears throat> I wanted to go on, on record expressing um, my appreciation that we've moved this forward. I know that when I met with Superintendent Evans, maybe the first year that he, that he came, he expressed the need for a middle school ELA curriculum and program and um, that we bring phonics to our lower grades. And we've been working on the 
for former, and now this will move us forward on the latter. And I think this is hopefully going to be a key towards achieving our equity goals because this is clearly a missing piece. And as the your last slide indicates, you know, obviously, especially with Common Core, but even without it, reading is is incredibly important. So, mm -hmm. I am very supportive. I did I did have one question about the program itself, sure. though. Sure. <clears throat> This question indicating that I have more time on my hands now. Um, and that is that I did go onto the website and look at the program. And all of the lessons that they demonstrated in their little videos involved smart boards. And is there a way to teach this without those smart boards? Yeah. That, Do you know what I mean? Like yeah. that is, they're all. Yeah. And we, when we piloted, we of course didn't use smart boards, but they have um, pretty great materials, teacher friendly materials, kid friendly materials, which is why I think this particular program got more support than any of the others. It's a, it's a lot like Sesame Street. A little bit. <laughs> but it is explicit phonics all the way. Just to be clear, this is going to be purchased for each classroom teacher, K to three. Yes. They're and not sharing materials. No, no sharing Every of classroom. materials. And basically, we will, um, in the first years, be K to three. And then at the point that we can see success with kids in those grade levels, it is possible that they we would stay focused on K2 and move three into a grammar vocabulary type of program at the same time. Okay, this is a discussion. It'll come back for action in two weeks. Thank okay. you. Thank you. <clears throat> Moving on to item number 17, bond and special tax planning update. Return of the Lou Jones, blast in the past. So this, is, this is your first meeting back, Lou, and you're, <laughs> you're after 1030. Don't you miss us? It's not the new and improved Lou Jones either. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not the new and improved board either. So, so board, I'd like to introduce you to uh, Lou Jones, um, <laughs> the old Lou Jones. Um, so we're bringing this item to the board uh, because we're starting to look at what we might need to do in 2020 in terms of planning. Um, for a new tax bond as well as the maintenance tax. And we know that all of our bonds that we've had in the past have served us very well and really helped us with the upkeep of our facilities. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done prior to us moving towards um, going out for another bond. So I've asked our uh, Lou to come in to explain what are the things that we need to do as we prepare for our next um, bond in 2020 and maintenance tax. Thanks. So um, in the past, the board has gone, in the last two um, cycles when they put a bond forward, there was also the maintenance tax. So our presumption is that they would go in tandem again. The maintenance tax will have some of the same challenges that we had when you went through BSEP recently because you have the increased um, retirement costs and you also have the split role question that will have to be dealt with. So, so um, it'll, it'll take some examination as well. This is not just about going forward with a bond. It's also about the special tax. So. Um, there we go. So uh, trying to start on the, on the things that have happened that would help um, a bond in the future. Educational specifications were um, prepared um, from in the June um, 15 to June 16 time period. They actually were not adopted by the board, although there was a recommendation to do so, but they were presented to the board. So that task is, is basically complete. We believe we'd have to go back and do a, some minor looking at them as part of a, a part of a work, the superintendent's work group. So the next step that's happening, and the board, I believe tonight, approved the master plan. Uh, I think that was one of the ones that wasn't pulled. I wasn't quite paying 100% attention to it. Um, and so he was approved tonight, and then we need him to start working on a master plan. The master plan is both a facilities assessment as well as an educational evaluation of our, of our facilities. Um, the, the public outreach. Just for the record, 12.3 was not pulled. It was on consent. Perfect. Thank you. Um, the, one of the things, we just haven't had a chance as a executive cabinet to sit down and talk about um, the outreach <coughs> and, and looking at the proposals when we were going through master planners. Uh, we, had, we received seven proposals, and they were all over the map of the amount of public um, outreach that, that might be necessary. So we just haven't had a chance to sit down and, and have that conversation about what we're, we're really going to be looking at. So we, we were, we're, the proposal went forward with the master planner based upon using their public process approach, but we, that may get adjusted um, with further dialogue. 
In the end, they'll have to estimate all the things. Um, as most of you know, when you go through this kind of process, you're unlikely to end up with things that are going to be all smooth and easy. You're going to end up having to make some difficult choices because um, there's a lot of ideas out there and there won't be as much funding as there will be the ideas. Consultant prepares a final master plan. So the next thing that starts, you can see we're already behind on this one already, is, is to, to start um, a superintendent's planning work group. We wanted to start in May. There was too many things going on. Uh, so it's starting at the end of June, and it, so it, it hasn't started yet. Um, so creation of the, of the planning group. Um, you know, we'll start working on the special tax items. Um, in this same window of time, kind of d being more directive with the master plan consultant, so probably we'll be attending most of the um, work group meetings, or at least if not every one, every other one. And then it, early on, we need to review the outreach approach by the consultant so we can see if it needs to be tweaked or if it works well for us. And then again, continuing to work on the final recommendations uh, um, for the maintenance special tax, and then to look at and review and comment on the draft master plan. So this is one group. This is kind of the first group. We see it as kind of a relatively small group, um, similar to what the district did in the past, recent past with its, its BCEP um, um, group. Then I think you have to get it out to a larger group. So we call this the facilities committee. And so this is a, would, would have more stakeholders involved in it. And it's a place where some ideas would end up being vetted. I'll give you an example. One of them came up tonight. You heard somebody come up and talk about wanting electric buses. Well, you might, that's something that might come up as an idea. It, a master planner is not going to look at that question, but that idea may come up. There's, I know the city has talked to the school district about things related to the pool. The master planner is not going to look at that. So there's a lot of ideas that may come up that need to be vetted through kind of a larger, larger group at that point. So again, the idea of formulating committee in January, holding some um, workshops and kind of uh, looking at things, um, potentially holding some additional outreach on a revised master plan or a plan above and beyond the master plan, and then kind of finalizing report the board on, on priorities. And then um, some of you may have seen a number of these bullets before because I, in all candor, um, I leaned on uh, Natasha Berry to help out with this. And a lot of these bullets are similar to what um, you saw before in the, um, in the BSEP presentation. Um, so then, you know, you've got to start then getting prepared for an election if it's going to occur. You've got to start looking at, at doing um, voter polls on tax rates for the measures. Obviously, there's going to be ongoing work with Executive Cabinet and the FSMOC and the CBOC and Ed Services and others. There'll be some outreach and presentation to community partners. I mean, the city obviously would have an interest in what we're doing. We'd want to outreach to them and say what we're thinking of doing. And then, um, you, then you know, kind of t getting towards the end, you have to start working on the actual language as well as the final financial um, uh, information. You still want to continue to have meetings with stakeholder groups. Um, and you, as I say, you get the final public survey on it, and then you end up with the final recommendation to the board for the bond, and probably the, the special tax will go at the same time um, to the board. And then, oops, Max hate me. <laughs> Rotate. Rotate. All right, let me try it. Oh. Uh, um, and then, you know, the board will have to final resolution in June in order to um, uh, final uh, put it on for the voters, and then November 3rd would be the election date. So this is the basic proposed timelines on it. We This is not just from myself. It's from everybody in executive cabinet with the addition of Natasha has reviewed um, the, the approach to this. And I, the one thing I can guarantee you is it will change around a little bit as we go further on in it. So this is really more of a roadmap than it is a you know, real tight tight way of the business will happen. So with that, we just wanted to give the board information of our thought process. All right. Thank you, Mr. Jones. Um, any questions? This is for discussion, right? So this is this, this, all these committees, well, they could in theory involve a board member or two are superintendent committees. So these are at the discretion of the superintendent to create, um, not ones that would go to the board for sort of approval of membership or anything like that. Questions? 
Director Apple. Yeah, quick question. So, um, and welcome back. My your last meeting was my first meeting. And, and this is th this, I believe, will be my second to last meeting. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll see about that. Um, well, that actually goes to one of my my one question, which is, and and I haven't been on the board since we've done this. Um, who? Uh, who who runs this whole process? Is it the facility? Like, it, who's the analog to Ms. Beery in the BSEP process? Is it the facilities director? Do we? Is it the master plan consultant? The master plan consultant can't run it. Uh, that that's not feasible. I mean, again, this is really a superintendent's work group. So I'm sure the superintendent will select whoever he wants to be the person pushing it. It would not be uncommon. It would be the facilities director. Um, I just want to channel our students and um, the, the sustainability plan and where that fits into here because I think our taxpayers also want to see and our students want to see that our master plan also has embedded in it a sustainability plan and ongoing, not just, just because we are, you know, I believe it's going to come to us in the fall, this is in our, our October. So, where would that fit, or is are we looking at that as also being part of this, along with the the educational specifications plan? I mean, so I think they're all somehow married together. The, the, there's quite a lot of information that the master planner is going to have to go through in order to be able to even start work. So. Um, both the master planner will have to look at our solar master plan, as will the sustainability consultant. So I think they both will dovetail together. Mm -hmm. um, most of the work that the sustainability people have been working on are really not bond related. There's a little bit that's bond related, but most of it is either curriculum based, some of it's maintenance based, some of it's operations based. But there is a component that is um, related to to um, large scale capital projects. And so it will be incorporated into, the, into a master well, plan. Well, I guess it's part of the into this bond in terms of green, uh, anything that's, you know, saving or, or waste or, um, re, you know, recycle, reuse, you know, our buses. I mean, that's the part that I'm looking at and thinking about. Yeah, I, I think it's a little bit of a challenge to have some of that fall into a capital program. I think certain things could do. I think the solar could fall into it. I think you could choose to buy equipment that, that, that helps the, the um, program. But I think most of the things that will come from that sustainable plan will be more program-based or more curriculum-based than they will be um, capital-based. There'll be some that will be, but I, don't, I think most of it will not be. I think that there is some, uh, though, I think the, the larger plan, I, I, think, I, I think that the sustainability plan, the hope is to include some s priorities around our building, but I think that regardless, I agree with you and uh, what I think is the core of what you're saying, that we if this is our opportunity to help direct our bond money to be, you know, used towards green building, to include, mm -hmm. you know, promote sustainable energy, that kind of yep. stuff. Is that, which is kind of, I think, what I heard you say. Yeah, which could be someone who does that, you know, in terms of monitoring that, because we don't have that right now. I don't know. We have, we have components of it, but we don't have an overall approach. You're, you're right. All right, so anything else on this one? Okay, thank you very much. You probably want to stay seated okay. because we're moving on to item 12.4 and 12.5. Okay. Um, Vice President Appel, Director Hempel, I know you pulled this item for discussion, um, not action. Um, do we need to extend the meeting? We have one other item that shouldn't involve much discussion um, beyond this. Do we, we have about 10 minutes. Are we going to take longer than that? I don't think so, not necessarily. All right, let's hit it in 10 minutes. Well, it needs to be less than 10 minutes if we have the other item. Nine minutes, go. <laughs> well, anyway, I guess the, 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 the very short discussion would be, is there any reason why we can't hold over these two items until the facility subcommittee gets a chance to have a full presentation on our CTE budget along with CTE staff. So here's my, here's, staff. here's my suggestion on that. So if the concern by the two board members or the board as a whole is on the CTE component, if that's the concern uh, and, and there aren't other concerns, I'd suggest to go forward, vote on everything else and keep the uh, Longfellow project in measure A, double A for right now because you could do that and it won't harm any that's going forward. I mean, it, we'll need to address it, but not, you don't need to address it for a couple months if you, don't, if, if you don't want to. But the other things, like the community, increasing the money for the community theater, if we don't do that, I'm not going to be able to hire an architect at the next board meeting, which is what the plan is. Um, so but, the, there, I think if the other things go forward, 
But uh, you just hold on the CTE, I don't think there'd be any conflict. And we could bring the CTE at the facilities. Absolutely, and, and it wouldn't even have to be at the next one. It could be at a, at a future one, because if you kind of take this, the current CTE project at uh, Longfellow, even though I believe it's chronically underfunded, it's only got $320,000 in there right now. If you left it in that budget, you'd still have a sufficient dollars, because there's in this proposal, there'd be $414,000 um, available balance. So you could just leave it in AA, and, 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 not, and not. But I don't think it's just the Longfellow makerspace. I think there's some questions about the mix of monies that are even being used at some of the projects at the high school and whether or not some of the projects that are right now down as being 100% CTE funded really, in fact, are general education, you know, are non CTE projects. And it would be easier to have a good feeling about that if we had first. Um, received at the facility subcommittee an overview of the CTE funds like we have had for Measure I and Measure AA. We, we, we had some um, technical challenge at the, last, at the last meeting. I'm sorry. That's true, but we have a facility subcommittee uh, for next week, and we have the last board meeting on the 27th, and so it doesn't seem to me that there's anything that can't wait for two weeks. Well, it sounds, oh, on that, you mean as, as far as this stuff? Well, because it's not just Longfellow. It's kind of the use of CTE money as a whole that we've not had that discussion at the facility <coughs> subcommittee to understand the whole like we've had for Measure I and like we've had for AA. But what I'm hearing from you is, I, I guess my question to follow up on that is, which of these items in, um, f in 3 and 4, 12.3 and 12.4, is there that urgency that you need to bring something forward next year? I mean, at the next meeting in order to move things along during the summer? Um, I think the, probably the only thing that would be affected is the community theater. And even then, it could come forward at the board meeting. But we would be operating under the assumption that there would be that increased budget that we are recommending an architect be approved. I mean, I actually have no problem. We, we did, just so everybody knows, we had this conversation at the, at the facility subcommittee meeting, and so then we had some concerns about the CTE budget. So I'm actually, I don't have, I, I, is there anything else on two through five that you feel like we didn't discuss properly and we should hold off on? Because nothing else in, in the impacts the CTE I budget. just don't want to have approved for going forward any project that has CTE funding until we've had a chance to look at the whole CTE funding budget and have an understanding. Right. I'm not saying that we will, at the end of the day, disagree with staff's recommendations, but that's the purpose of having a facility sure. subcommittee. Is, but I mean, Because yeah. this is a policy issue. It's not just you know, inking some contracts. It's yeah. a policy issue on how we're using those money. No, so, no, I, I hear you, but I just, I don't think that, I, for example, I don't think that the, um, that the, it, that the, um, the community theater, that the community theater project includes the use of any additional CTE funds. I thought that it did. In addition to what we'd already talked about? No, I mean, no. The, the, the community theater project I mean, we're taking that out of the maintenance yard. Money. Right. The community theater project is the biggest budgetary challenge we have. And basically, it's moved around five or six times, not when I was here, but of what the project scope was going to be. And just to be able to do the classroom area and to do the corridor going across it takes up all this, all this amount of money. And, and that's, just, that's just getting you to, to what is kind of what I would call the minimal scope that you'd want to do in that building. So I'm going to make a suggestion, just thinking about time. It sounds like what I'm hearing from you, Mr. Jones, is that you can bring back on the 27th the expanded budget and the architect at the same meeting. But that's sort of on the assumption that this board is comfortable with that, because typically it would be one right. then the other. I, I mean, to a certain extent, we did it tonight as well, because we were assuming that there would be an increase for the Rosa Parks roof, which is going to cost a bunch of money, and we came forward on this agenda with an increase so, for the for the architect. Okay. So what I and it's you have a facilities sub subcommittee next week. Yes. What mm -hmm. what day of the week? 20. That's a Wednesday. 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 Okay. And and there are a lot of other things on the agenda. This is not the only thing yeah. scheduled for the so, June twentieth. So I'm going to suggest that the community theater items, the two items, the budget. Ex expansion and the architect item come forward on consent on the 27th together is that that seems to be something with the facility committee and then all the other stuff since you the three of you know way more about it than we do 
if you want to bring something else forward that's appropriate on the 27th, obviously that's the prerogative of staff and the committee. Does that seem like an okay way forward? Yeah, it's fine with me. And I will say if you guys can trust us that if we have time to, if we have time, if we all agree, if we will all agree on what we're bringing forward, we will just have it on consent. I just think we yeah. weren't quite ready. No, consent yet. is consent okay. is good. Okay. Thank okay. You. Is that fine with you? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much, Mr. Jones. All right, last item, item 18, approval of the 1819 single plan for student achievement. Uh, is there a motion to approve the plans? Motion by uh, Director Alper. Would Director Nagaraj and Swenson like to second the last action item of her school board career? I'll second it. Woo! <laughs> All right. Well, we will do a roll. We will do. A, we'll do a roll call vote. Don't give that face. We'll do a roll call vote for the last vote. Yeah. <laughs> Director Hemphill. Yes. <laughs> Director Nagarajan Swenson. Yes. <laughs> Director Leva Cutler. Yes. Director Alper. Yes. Vice President Appel. Yes. President Daniels. Yes. Is there public comment? Mom, <laughs> you want to embarrass your daughter? No, She's like, no. All right, all right. It's Uma, one of the few pleasures we have left at your age. OK, you guys ready? Meeting adjourned. Woo! Woo! OK, wait. Amazing. Ooh, embarrassing your children. Is one of the few pleasures we have I at this know, point. Yeah. <laughs> I, I take pictures. Fewer and fewer, fewer and fewer. I take pictures on a weekly basis that I then save of Emmett. Like, yep. Save